It's Lit Book Reviews, back at it again. With back me, as always, again. is Robert Pattinson and your favorite host, Christian Bale. Mm. We're here to give you another absolute friggin' banger. Today, we are talking about John Meacham's Thomas Jefferson, mm. The Art of Power. Mm-hmm. This is a good one, folks, and I've got a, I've got a lot of notes, so... Mm-hmm. Um, this is one that I read. Just finished it today, actually. Uh, Mr. Pattinson has not read it, so mm-hmm. this is just going to be things with you, funky, fresh uh, mm-hmm. for you today. Just so, so everyone knows, you, this book you could tear a rotator cuff <laughs> doing one of these. So what's crazy about this book, um, and about all of John Meacham's book, which he's becoming one of my favorite authors. Uh, this is the third book I've read by him. What are the other ones he read? So I read, oh no, it's only the second. Uh, I read a book called The Soul of America by him, which is kind of a broad general, like overview of the presidency. Um, and it came out like 2018 or 2020 or something. And kind of just, him just kind of talking about the purpose of the presidency and a lot of different things that people have done. And it's a really, really good read. Like it's not like a political thing or anything. It's just really good. Um, yeah. But the great things about his books is, This is a a 750-ish page book, but the epilogue ends at page 505. So this much of the book is all notes and resources. I mean, you are not getting this guy on his facts. He references literally, I I assume every sentence in this book is referenced. That's 300 pages of notes and sources. So That's historical integrity at its finest. Yeah. So you know a good author when you see that many notes. Uh, if you're reading a book that's nonfiction and there's not a lot of notes, I'd be wary in the very at the very least. So um, just a little quick info blah blurb on the book. Uh, this one's got 39,078 uh, ratings on Goodreads with a 4.03 overall, which is really good. Um, it actually won a Goodreads Choice Award nominee for best history and biography in 2012 and it is a pulitzer prize winner as well which Mm. we've somewhat established on this channel doesn't really mean much or at least it seems like it doesn't but this book definitely deserved it it's really really good so um overall you probably know thomas jefferson as the third president of the united states as well as the author of the declaration of independence and uh I didn't really know much more than that about him going in. I've recently read uh, David McCullough's John Adams, so I definitely got a lot of Jefferson in there, but it was just in relation to John Adams, so it was more about their relationship than anything else. Um, I learned a ton from this book. Like I said, John Meacham is an amazing author, so before I dive into, like, all the details and stuff, I'm kind of on, like, like a founding father's kick right now. I read Washington by Ron Chernow um, early in the year. Read John Adams recently, and now I'm on this. I've got Madison, Monroe, Quincy, and Jackson all coming up. So Mm. I'll have videos of those in the coming months. Um, Just on a little founder's kick, it's actually, it's crazy, even as an American growing up and learning the history of America, just reading a book about one of these guys, realizing how much you don't actually know about the founding of America and the Revolutionary War. And all the stuff that happened afterwards, like all the stuff leading up, like, you know, basically the Declaration of Independence and then the Revolutionary War, but all the stuff that led up to it and all the stuff after is pretty fascinating as well. The timeline of everything's crazy. Um, So there's a lot to dive into. So I'll just say at the beginning of this, if you're interested in any of that, this is a really, really good book. You're going to learn about, obviously, Thomas Jefferson, but you're going to learn a lot of other stuff that revolved or was, you know impactful or related to his life obviously the revolution you know independence uh the french revolution a lot of stuff about france you're going to learn a good bit about washington and john adams um and a lot of other political figures of the time uh alexander hamilton who he had a very you know tumultuous relationship with which i'll get into a bit yeah um but yeah i mean overall it's one of the best books I've read on a president ever. Um, it rivals uh, the the Washington book. It's better than David McCullough's John Adams, in my opinion. It's right on par. It's a little less extensive than Ron Chernow's book on George Washington. But yeah, that was a thick boy. Yeah, super thick. Um, but it's really, really good. Uh, Gordon S. Wood, 
who is who is an author who's written a book about Jefferson and Adams' relationship and several other nonfiction history books. He uh, his review of it, which is on the cover of the book, says probably the best single volume biography of Jefferson ever written. Mm. And you know that's coming from another author who has written about Jefferson. So he's like, dang, yeah. he's better than me. Um, Good old Tom. Yeah, appreciate your help there, brother. So, mm-hmm. um, that's kind of all I can say about the book. Without before I dive into a, what will probably be a pretty lengthy summarization of what I learned from the book and my takeaways, but I gave it five out of five. Uh, it's one of the best books I've read this year. It'll be at the top of the list at the end of this year for sure. Um, if you're a lover of history, especially American history, especially the revolution and the founding fathers, I think this is a must read for you. Um, and I think that's about it. I can say, I, I will say as well, like there's obviously a lot of things about Jefferson's life that today are pretty, I mean, controversial is a light word to use. He was obviously a slave owner, big time, had Mm -hmm. a lot of them. Um, So there's a lot of complexities to his life, and by no means am I or does this author justify any of that, but he does put it into the context of the times, and there's some pretty interesting things I learned even in that regard uh, that were really cool that I'll get into. So It's crazy that you even have to preface that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I do. Maybe I shouldn't, but I, I feel mean, like I do. You probably do in today's time, but I mean, you're better than I would because I wasn't. I wouldn't. I mean, it's like yeah. if someone's gonna be your favorite historical figure, not that Jefferson is. It's like yeah. people did bad things. Yeah, people no did lots of bad things. Done bad things. Yeah, so like, it's like Adolf Hitler is your favorite. Like he, exactly, you know, he was I mean, bad. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, just kidding, kidding. Jokes. Stalin. Um, but it is you know before we dive into all that, I mean, just as far as that aspect of his life, the fact that he owned slaves. I mean, he was a Virginia planner that grew into it. And it is easy and it is very much true to say that he was uh, a man of the times because a lot of people in the South owned slaves. That was kind of how the economy worked back then. But it's not fair to say that, oh, everyone did that. Because if you watched our previous John Adams video on the book that I read, or if you know anything about him, there were people like John Adams who absolutely abhorred slavery. John Adams referred to it as a that foul contagion. That's the mm. word he used, and I couldn't find that phrase in my mind when we did the John Adams video, foul but contagion. it's actually referenced in this book, so I made a note of it. Well, there had to be people that opposed it, or else it would still exist. Yeah, and we'll it's even get into it. Jefferson, and it's a crazy complexity that I can't even fully understand after having read it, but Jefferson didn't fully support it. Like, he called it that hideous blot late in his life like he throughout his career we'll get into it you know did make efforts to work towards the abolishment of slavery we'll get into the details in the book but anyway all that being said no when you're reading about a real person they're going to be flawed there's going to be issues that you see uh in both their character and their decisions actions all that kind of stuff um because we're all flawed and you know there are a lot of historians who argue and will look you in the face and tell you, like, if you were a white person that lived in the 1700s in America, you would have owned slaves. And I'd like to think I wouldn't, but again, it was well, a part of the most economy. Most people didn't own slaves. Well, yeah, most people didn't, That's but if you were in a situation thing. where you could have yeah. and where it was a part of the life that you inherited, um, yeah. which again was a lot of what Jefferson's. Again, there's absolutely no justifying slavery by any means, yeah. but when but I, you're reading about this time, if you want to understand not just slavery, but all the stuff surrounding it, you do have to look at it for what it is. And it's a horrible thing. It is a hideous blot in our history. It's also a hideous blot on everybody's history. There's not a single country when you go back far enough that did not have slavery. So it's really a hideous blot on humanity. We used to own each other, and like it or not, we still do to a degree. There are slaves today. Yeah. There are labor slaves. There are sex slaves. There are child slaves all over the world. So it's still a horrible thing, and there will be no justification for slavery in this video. There will be no justification for any person who owns slaves in this video. But I we think are going to. like a misconception, though, that like everybody owned 12, 13, 14, 15 slaves. Like, if someone did own slaves, they owned a singular slave. Yeah. They Except also... Jefferson, who had a lot. Well, so, but he was one of the, he was the rich. small minority. Yeah. Um, because most people, if they're going to own a singular slave, then they're all, they're obviously highly dependent on that singular slave for production. And obviously again, not justifying, but obviously, I mean, 
it's a, a product of those times. So it wasn't like, hey, let's whip this slave until they die. Because yeah. it was a valuable resource. Yeah. Um, it I shouldn't have said it. They were a valuable resource. So, yeah. I mean, but the thing is, is, and so, I don't know. I mean, obviously, slavery was a terrible thing, but I think sometimes it gets, not glamorized, but you see Django Unchained or something, and you think that most slaves lived on plantations when they didn't. Yeah, there's a lot of complexities to it. Um, you know, again, nothing makes it okay, and it's horrible, and no one should ever try to justify, like, the means or anything like that. But it is way more complex than we like to realize nowadays. Again, I mean, none of it was okay. None of, you know, nobody would say, oh, they had an envious life, those slaves on this particular no. plant. Because at the end of the day, they were still property, and that's horrifying. That a but human there were would be levels, property. though. I mean, you can't say that there weren't. Oh, there were definitely levels to like, it. Like, you'd rather be a slave for, from someone than someone than else. Because, someone like, else, I mean, I'm sure. sure there were those guys that was like, oh, man. Yeah. And there definitely hope were. You don't get sold yeah. that way because if you do. Yeah. He's just beating the life. shit out of you the yeah. rest of your life. Yeah. So there were a lot of those situations, like you refer to Django Unchained, a lot of those things did happen. And there were people like Leonardo DiCaprio's character in that movie. Um, but then there were people like Jefferson, who I'll go ahead and say, because I don't even have a note for this, but I remember it in the book. Like, Early on in Jefferson's life, he tried to advocate for a policy change because pre-revolution, the the colonies were ran by British constituents. There would be a governor that was British that ran a colony. There weren't American people that were born in America that were running these colonies. So yeah. if you owned a slave back then, pre-revolution, and you wanted to free your slave, which people wanted to do all the time, a lot of times it was for economic reasons. Not all of them were, you know, being altruistic about it. But if you wanted to free a slave, you couldn't just do that. You had to go to the governor of your colony and ask him. And nine times out of ten, he would say no. Yeah. For whatever reason, he doesn't dive into, like, why that was. I'm sure a lot of it, again, was for economic reasons. But you couldn't even do that yourself if you wanted to. Um, so there's just a lot of complexities. Um that go into that whole thing. It was horrible. It was an abhorrent, hideous blot, that foul contagion, all that different stuff. Um, but I say all that to say it was a part of this man's life and it was one of the most complicated and uh, kind of contradictory aspects of his life because there's a lot of times when he says certain things or talks about a certain thing a certain way where you're like, how do you say that? And then literally have slaves. So it's very complicated. Um, and again, yeah. to refer to John Adams, who was also a very flawed man, and we'll talk about him more in the video, he saw it the right way. You know, he saw it as a horrible thing that, uh, and he saw it in the right way. He didn't just see it as a horrible thing for economic reasons or for political reasons. He saw it for what it was, and he thought owning yeah. humans was bad. And that's all there was to it for him and his wife. So I'm curious to where John Adams grew up, though. Well, he grew up in Massachusetts, and his dad was an abolitionist as well. His yeah. dad hated slavery. They never he said he owned slaves. He grew up slaves. on a farm, though, right, outside of like yeah. somewhere in Massachusetts? Because, I yeah. mean, if I remember correctly, like obviously there are farms outside of the South, but they're not growing cash crops where it requires like hard yeah. manual labor to yeah. to yield a profit, whereas if Jefferson, he grew up in Virginia. I know he's He from, was a planter. Yeah. He was a Virginia so, planter. I mean, That's prime slave owning yeah, they're like, not growing crops that you only need two people to like no. reap a harvest i mean they're heavy no especially pre-cotton gin i mean yeah which i don't even know if cotton was that profitable until the cotton gin it might uh, have been more mostly what he had he was like tobacco and yeah. um some other stuff I, I forget that really didn't dive into a lot of what he actually but he grew up where that's way more well, normalized yeah. obviously we're opposed to adam's yeah, for sure. Adams grew up like like dirt poor. So he didn't have Adams family couldn't afford a slave to begin with when yeah. he was growing up. But and in the region they were at, it probably yeah. wasn't as popular either. Yeah, most likely. Um but I say that to say like there were a lot of people who at the time did believe it was horrible. So it's it's you can't just say oh everybody thought it was fine because that was not the case. There were people pre-revolution who thought it was horrible. Obviously England beat us to the punch on abolishing slavery so across the pond there were people who knew it was horrible yeah but that's also i mean it's that's a whole nother discussion yeah they, um, they weren't it's not like they're morally better it's no just, you don't have the no you don't have the biome if they yeah. had a, an area in england to where they could yield a crop 24 or yeah. 12 months out of the year 
it would have taken them a little longer too. Yeah, just because yeah. economically they didn't need yeah. slaves as much. I mean, yeah, and that's you the hate thing. To make it an economic point, but like that's well, that's, that's the really reason slavery is. was a thing think, for the oh, most part. There were certainly people was, who too. were horrible and who just liked you know owning people and beating them and all that yeah. other stuff. But the reason it was such a prominent part of American culture is because it was economic. Like you yeah. said, these people couldn't farm their land by themselves. Mm-hmm. And when you're looking at a market economy. A farmer, if you got two farmers living next to each other and one of them has a hundred slaves and one of them tries to do it without the slaves, this guy's never keeping up with the no. market. He's never going to sell enough. He's never going to be able to keep his land. Again, doesn't make it okay, but that was the world they lived in. Unless you wanted to go broke and not feed your family and you were a planner and you owned land that needed to be farmed, you owned slaves. Yeah. Um, you know so, the sad truth, though, not to continue this point, is um, America abolishes slavery, obviously. Mm-hmm. And then we just transfer that slavery to Asia oh, yeah. with our factories. So it's oh, like, yeah. it's one of those things too, like no one, I mean, not that no one wants to talk about it because there are people talking about it, but like no one yeah. cares enough because like we're still going to yeah. buy Apple yeah. and when it's way these different. headphones and like everything else, you know. Yeah. They're just going to outsource to where, Yeah, uh, it's not slavery, but it's I mean, it's, it's arguably worse in some ways for oh, some of those yeah. people, um, depending on the levels. And again, not to take away from how bad slavery was. But you're right, and it's a very good point. It was easy, not to, not to take away from John Adams' view on this, but it was a lot easier for John Adams to walk down the street and see a bunch of slaves owned by white men and him be disgusted by it than it is for us to use our iPhones and never see or be anywhere near mm-hmm. the cobalt, true, cobalt yeah. mines in the Congo. We don't even, that may as well not exist to most of us because oh, yeah. we don't actually see it. It's yeah. not tangible. We don't Especially understand in, if that. Especially you've never traveled outside of America and your perspective is Especially, America. Especially, yeah. You're like the Congo. Are like, we, is that real? You're talking about the heart of darkness? <laughs> I mean, God. <laughs> like, yeah. um, it's just, it is crazy, the, the lack of awareness, which, I mean, it's tough. Like you said, I mean, it's way easier to be in an atom situation and have awareness than it's hard to, to know stuff that you can't touch and see and feel. Yeah, when so, it's it's like, the same it's with just, sex trafficking, it's all like faith. through uh, different outlets like Passion City and different things that you and I grew up hearing all the time, we've known about the problem of sex slavery for over a decade. With the end it movement, with the end it movement, like, all that stuff, we've been hearing about it forever and known like the numbers and how bad it is, how rampant it is. But now, like with the Sound of Freedom and like different kind of crazy. stuff, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, yeah, like we've heard about it, but the Sound of Freedom comes out and you got people being like, "What is this happening?" Um, so. You know, it's just a matter of exposure. I mean, we live in a different time now where you can have a trillion things going on in your life and you still don't know the vast majority of what's going on in the rest of the world because there's 8 billion people here and there's a lot going on. So, And I think most people think how America is, like the day-to-day life that we live, the mundane, go to Kroger, get groceries, order Uber Eats later that day, like play Xbox, whatever, that the majority of the world population is living a similar life on the similar like quality of life scale. And they're not, they're not, or that like the rules of like, Hey, you know what? If I don't agree with something, you know, I can like use my voice and like go complain or like go tell someone that can make it happen or then vote for someone who's going to do what I, what I believe in where. And then I think people just assume that that's how it works. Everywhere. In other places, and it's like, it doesn't. It's so, not. like, you can complain all you want about how, like, certain things aren't, you know, fully the way they should be. Because, I mean, America's not perfect either. But, I mean, don't think for a second that it's not way worse somewhere else. Yeah. Um, Just economically, the amount of opportunity, like, the things that you, you have the freedom to do. I mean, if you think we're sexist here, go hop into... Just freaking drop your finger on a map somewhere in the Middle East and fly over there and see how well you get treated as a woman. <laughs> or Africa. I mean, especially like with gender roles. If you don't believe in gender roles, go yeah. anywhere in the continent of Africa. Yeah. You don't have to tell a woman in, in Africa that she's a woman and that these are the things she should be doing. Like, whatever, you know, region they're at. Like, I guarantee you there's just certain things that women do and certain things men do. And then there's certain things that they both do as well. Yeah. It's not like there's only men or women things, but... Whereas here, you know, you can't even say that. You can't even be like, well, yeah, that's more of a one. Which I guess, like, our society isn't built the same way theirs is. So yeah, that, I mean, we've definitely grown as a society, like, yeah. to where women can do. We're a not hunter gatherer society, yeah. to where right, 
you know, you need that, that sort of thing. But anyway. Yeah, it's a very complicated thing to get into, and we're not going to get into it anymore. <laughs> we're going to start diving into Thomas Jefferson. Um, and, so, and a lot of this stuff will come back up as I go through. So basically what I'm going to do for this is just kind of – I made notes – and I pretty much had at least one note for every chapter. So there's probably a good 35 or 40 notes that I have here. So I'm just going to kind of go through them, which is going to be a little bit of a walk through Jefferson's life and then just kind of my takeaways. Walking so I'm going to walk you through it, man. I'm going to start saying stuff. If you want to interrupt at any point, just stop me. Um, I'll read these notes off. And then if I have more to say about it, I will. I want to know Thomas Jefferson after this. I mean, you're about to know him intimately. So. Starting out from the beginning, uh, born to a line of successful and wealthy Virginia planners, very educated and well-read from an early age, uh, very interested in philosophy and human nature. So this is something that comes up throughout Jefferson's life, even when he doesn't have a lot of time to devote to philosophy and human nature. There's kind of always a prism that he's looking through that is based in philosophy and human nature. Like he's mm-hmm. very interested just in people. There's a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence and people like letters that we've seen where people talk about their interactions with Jefferson. And he's like just super interested in like just what did you do today? Like he'll meet a person be like, so what did you do today? Like and he'll listen so intently and he just likes learning about how people operate. So very people oriented person, love to get to know people, human nature, philosophy, all that kind of stuff. Um, So when he started out uh, as a young guy, and this is in his early 20s, he did work as a lawyer. Um, There's not a ton of like references in this book to different cases, but the ones he does reference kind of make it clear that a lot of the cases Jefferson worked on were pretty obscure. So there's no like huge case where it's like this defining moment in his career as a lawyer. Um, But that is how he started out. Like uh, John Adams defending the Philadelphia Massacre. Please stop. (laughs) Dude, are you really going to bring that up right now? Dude, sorry, I had to make a connection. To our previous founding father. Oh, man, that hurts. Um, So uh, he was a very particular guy, kept meticulous notes on most of the details of his life, uh, enjoyed the finer things, uh, such as his elegant, well-built home at Monticello. But this kind of went into every aspect of his life, other than his clothes, really. He usually dressed like kind of like a farmer, maybe a Mm -hmm. little bit like a wealthy farmer. But outside of that, he had super fine, like, decor, like rugs. The house was always nice. He built Monticello and then tore it down and rebuilt it again, even nicer. Um, and as his life went on, he had more and more stuff like that, like paintings from all over the world, busts made of different, you know, people throughout uh, that were in- inspirational to him or just important in general. So just a very well-read um kind of fancy guy with a lot of cool stuff um, mm. but all of it had like meaning like you know you walk into his house and it's like you're walking down memory lane of human history okay. uh, towards the end of his life at least not necessarily at the beginning um, so yeah uh, of his six children uh, with his wife Martha only two lived past a very young age um, which is kind of another defining thing throughout his life he ends up yeah. losing his wife Martha who we called Patty um, you know at some point in his life earlier than you know you would have expected or he would have liked obviously yeah. but has six children most of them die and then even of the two that live only one is alive when he dies so <sighs> one ends up dying later after childbirth um and they were both daughters that he had so jefferson never had a son that lived to any any age that mattered other than his Bro, children with sally would... hemmings that we'll get to <laughs> um, can you imagine being in that time period and like you and your wife finally get pregnant, and then like the first child dies. Then you go through the horrible three. rigors of pregnancy in the 1700s. Oh, that, and then the first child dies like after yeah. like three years, and it's like tragedy. Obviously, then it's yeah. like, all right, we're ready to have another child. Have another child. It gets to like six. Oh, not even that, dude. Die. None of them lived past like two, except the ones that lived <sighs> through it's adolescence. Like, well, I don't even know if you could. I mean. You know, I could see where it's like, all right, I don't want to try anymore. Oh, yeah. Which I don't know what contraceptives looked like back then, so maybe they weren't even trying. I mean, I don't think there were any. (laughs) And it it was was way more difficult. Not that it's not, you know, very difficult now, but it was way more of a difficult thing for women to have children back then. It was way more life-threatening. The recovery took Uh way longer and was, you know, you're more likely to die, you know, giving birth to a child than you are nowadays. It was a coin flip. It really was, dude. Like, if it didn't go well, you're probably going to die. Like... And your baby probably will, too. And that was a thing of the times. Like, kids died a lot. The mortality Mm -hmm. rate for children was way higher than it is now, which is kind of just one of the historical examples of how much better life has gotten for humanity. So write that down if you think your life sucks. Yeah. Um, Dude, you know John Brown, the guy who raided Harper's Ferry? Yeah. 
like talking about abolitionists, I mean, just crazy. I mean, honestly, too far that way. Um, <laughs> I believe he he had like eleven children die, or something like ridiculous. Think about all that time in, like, like just waiting to have a child. Like during like those women or her because he had two wives. Like one died, and then one I believe. Fact check me on this in the comments, everybody. Oh, all you oh, listeners, all oh, these listeners. <laughs> Um, but I believe it was like 11 and it's like, dude, his wife spent a decade pregnant and yeah. none of them survived. Yeah. That's horrible, anyway, man. So it's crazy. Yeah. Crazy part of the times. I mean, not to mention they didn't have AC, so pretty rough, <sighs> pretty rough time to live. I it's mean, like if Virginia in the summer, if something happened, like for some reason, like AC just stopped working all over the world and we were never going to get it back. I don't know how far I would make it into Bro, this new world. I think that's why more people lived up North. I mean, yeah, but then even then, you have the cold and the snow, and yeah, but no you can snow plows. Up <laughs> and there's fire. But dude, no insulation in your house. I mean, you buy the fire. You're bro. right. You're you in buy. the fire. <laughs> you're in the fireplace, <laughs> eating dinner. <laughs> um. So yeah, definitely a tough time to live. But uh, we'll get more into that as it happens, as far as his children and his wife passing. But so to kind of jump forward a little bit, I mean, there's not a ton to know about Jefferson before pre-revolution events start occurring because that's when he really started making a name for himself and when things started getting written down. Um, and that, that was in his early 20s when this stuff starts happening. So uh, concerned with representation and taxation early on, especially as a wealthy man who was limited by London and how he could use his money, especially buying coveted land. So essentially even wealthy people, and it really actually an interesting interesting thing I learned was Pre-revolution, a lot of the Americans that were starting to, you know, uh, chirp about problems with Britain were usually the wealthiest people because they were the yeah. ones that were realizing first, like, oh, Britain's not really letting us do anything. We're being treated as second-class citizens, which is kind of what I have written next is eventually he writes a letter to King George III, who is the King of Britain at this time and during the Revolutionary War, asking him to consider the well-being of his countrymen. Most Americans at the time considered themselves essentially British and felt that they were being treated as second-class citizens who could be taken advantage of with no consequences. So yeah. that was a cool thing I never thought about was, like, Americans saw themselves as British. just an extension of Britain. And so when they were being treated unfairly, it wasn't like, oh, we're like, you know, a foreign people that are being mistreated by our, you know, our, our owner or our king. It's like, we're British. Like, we are you. Yeah. We're just the American version of you that are on this continent that you wanted us to be at. And now you're, like, you know, taxing the hell out of us and not yeah. letting us buy land that we freaking live right next to that you can't do anything with. Yeah. Um, it's not like how the Cherokee feel. The Cherokee. Oh, man. There are some interesting things about his uh, interactions and Native thoughts Americans. on the Native Americans, which, you know, they really took some major L's throughout history. Well, he so. was the one who, well, I mean, I'm sure he'll get in this. He financed Lewis and, Lewis and Clark. Yeah, he did. Um, so, yeah, so essentially, like, early on, the biggest thing for Jefferson and people like him was taxation without representation. So they were getting overly Old taxed. Patrick Henry. Old Patrick Henry was a big part of this. They were getting overtaxed, and they didn't have American, like, representatives parliament. in Parliament. Yeah. So no one that cared about their interest was representing them. And this is obviously a huge um, talking point throughout a lot of history for a lot of different societies is not being represented where the decisions are being made. So and That ends up laying the foundation for um, statehood, or, well, for yeah. the, the split of federal... Mm -hmm. in state powers yeah as well as the electoral college and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff um it's all based uh, that, that was really like one of the cornerstones of independence was having proper representation was if we're not going to get it then we're just not going to be involved with you so early on that was really big um continuing with that uh, he was obviously very involved in pre -rev pre-revolution developments, including calling for armed militias to be prepared defensively, especially after hearing Patrick Henry speak on the matter and being elected deputy of the Second Continental Congress. So Jefferson was elected as deputy of the Second Continent Continental Congress. And interestingly enough, because he never fought in war, he was never a military guy, but throughout his career, he was always very heavy on just as far as, like, you know, Prepa the preparedness of the military of America. So yeah. early on, before there was really any talk of war or anything like that, Jefferson was writing letters to people and advocating like, 
okay, we need to start like building up here because if this goes to the end of this line, us talking to Britain this way and us, if we get to the end of this, it's independence, which means war because they're not going to yeah. want to let this resource go. So very early on before any revolution talk, he was making comments like, yo, we need guns, we need gunpowder, we need all this different stuff, and we need to like have like a militia, yeah. essentially. Um, we need to have a lot of different ones. Um, so yeah, that was an important thing. Um, so he writes a pamphlet called The Summary View on the Issues Between London and the Colonies. And this is what essentially like shot him off. It was called The Summary View, and it was essentially him just arguing why london or, or how london was mistreating the americans so bad and it was mostly about taxation without representation yeah um, but there were also some other things sprinkled in there but this kind of shot him to the forefront of the revolutionary era because again like i said in the beginning it was mostly wealthy educated and well-informed and involved people in america that were the first ones who wanted to kind of detach from britain or at least started talking about it but when he writes the summer review this goes out to all the colonies and a ton of just regular Americans start reading it. And then they read this and essentially you have the effect of, you know, these people are living lives in America. And if you're, if you're living in a colony that's not existed for that long and you're over the pond from your mother country yeah. and life is hard, you, you essentially have a mindset of, well, this is what being a new colony is like. Yeah. You're but then you day by day. Yeah, and you're like, this is just how it is because we're freaking tilling new land. We're doing new stuff. Like, we don't have yeah. a lot of resources. But then you read this pamphlet by Jefferson and you go, wait, my life could have been better this whole time if they weren't just taking 70% of our money and yeah. not representing us in parliament. If you're a regular, you know, average Joe that's just farming and trying to make sure your kids don't die before they turn one, like, you don't keep up with this stuff. You don't know what's yeah. going on in Parliament. So this really shot them to the forefront because people, it just kind of livened people up and got a lot of people in on the conversation of Britain being a problem. Um, Talk about a fumbled bag. Who? Bro, Great Britain. Oh, they fumbled the bag so the hard. ultimate fumbled bag. Of all t I don't know if there is a bigger fumbled bag. Maybe India. I, I mean, they know. fumbled the United States of America. <laughs> I mean, yeah, what we've become, I guess, apart from India, I mean, is with population and whatnot. I mean, obviously that was later on with imperialism, but, bro. I mean, it, it would literally, England would be where we are now. It'd be an but extension. Eng England would just be the with major power of the world, yeah. That's all. Just, yeah. with, just with treating it like England. Mm -hmm. Treating America like it was England. Like England yeah. just expanded. Yeah, and, and, to, now, and to go back to that note, because you're right, all King George III had to do was be like, okay, everybody yeah. over there, elect someone in your colony. We'll put them in parliament. But he was like, no. He was like, that's my that's my land. You'll do exactly what I tell you. What a bad call. And it is it is a bad call, but you look at it from the perspective of him, and you're like, man, this dude was completely detached. He'd yeah. never been to America. He didn't Where know anything advisors, about it. Bro? I mean, all of them. But again, the problem was when you don't have representation – that means you don't have people to inform the king in parliament. So these yeah. people were all just misinformed. They were thinking, bro, they've got it made over there. They got new land. They're building new stuff. They're having a great time. We'll tax them as much as we want. That's our resources. They're just over there doing it for us. So they forgot about the, just the humanity of it. They just forgot, oh, those are real people that are trying to raise their children, trying to build a future. And they just, they bro, fumbled the was, back. Where was England's Thomas Jefferson? I mean, or John Adams at the time. It didn't exist. There Did were some people. Did we only people. have them? Like, who who, who were their <laughs> guys that had brains? Because obviously the U.S., which we've talked about this before, I mean, talk about getting lucky with the, the oh, culmination yeah. of great minds. And not, oh, like, yeah. just minds, but the guys who, like, wanted to use what they thought and, like, actually, like, make a move with it with... Mm -hmm. I mean, guys like Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Hamilton yeah. and yeah. Henry Clay. And, like, I mean, mm -hmm. so many of those guys. Yeah. Like without those, I mean, we're, we would be nowhere. Oh, we'd be nowhere. But where were England's those guys? Like, we couldn't have, you know what I mean? And like you said, I guess there are some of them. but There were some who spoke out the against. has the power. It doesn't really yeah. matter. Well, that's what I was going to say. There were some who spoke out against it. But when you're in a monar monarchy that's existed for hundreds of years, it's been established, and you're just yeah. like, you know, praise the king or whatever. They were just stuck in a rut, dude. They just were who they were. They loved the monarchy. They thought it was so dope. Obviously, George the Third loved it, and I think George the Third was kind of adult too. So I don't think he really thought it out very well. Yeah. Um, from what I've understand, I have a book on him by the same guy that wrote Napoleon that I'll read in the next fifteen years. But I don't think he was the sharpest tool in the shed, if you will. 
Yeah. Um, because again, that's what happens when you have a monarchy. That's why monarchies are bad. Everybody is because if you just inherit a throne and ultimate There's power, and you're not cut out for that it. I've read in fantasy that seem to work a lot better. I mean, yeah, dude, if you have a shard blade guy. and you're a great guy, then I would work yeah, out. If you have high honor, just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess if the storm different. father is your spren, you'd probably be a great king. <laughs> But oh, man. that's the reason monarchies don't work is because you end up with people like George the Third that are not cut out to be king and mistreat their constituents. Yeah, not hereditary. Well, I guess is that what a monarchy is? It is hereditary. Can the word yeah. monarchy mean? Monarchy uh, just means there's a king. That there's you like can have a one person without it being hereditary. I would say that's why hereditary monarchies don't work. Yeah, for sure. But a monarchy in general is just when a, when one person has all the power. Yeah. But a hereditary monarchy is yes yeah. is the example of what I'm making. There's examples of like the guy which they usually don't last that long but just because back then you didn't live long but well, guys who come in and they actually knew what they were doing they were smart they wanted yeah. they were good people there have been good huge kings huge things happen but but the problem is it's hereditary it's tough well and the problem again inherently in a monarchy is the only way it works is if the one guy that's king yeah. is great and so if you end up with a bad him. one yeah, yeah if you end up with a bad one then life sucks for everybody until that guy dies yeah. or gets deposed so that's the problem with a monarchy is you can't ensure that it's going to be great. And you can't ensure that a democracy or a republic is going to be great. But at least you have that's a lot people more people say. involved yeah. so that, like, you know, there's checks if and the balances. If people decide something bad, then it's kind of on It's them. on the people. Yeah. yeah. And, and if, too bad there's no magical sword that just sticks in the ground and then it just decides who has honor. You know, dude, whoever can pull it out and then they're king. Too bad Odin won't throw down a hammer and just say, if he be worthy, he shall possess the power yeah, of Thor. Exactly. Um so yeah, uh, that's essentially kind of the pre-revolution stuff. He writes the pamphlet, summary view, um, and then we kind of get to, uh, you know, he does the Second Continental Congress. He's involved in the military, writes that pamphlet, yada, yada, yada. And then he's chosen as the head delegate and the writer of the Declaration of Independence, with the number two choice being John Adams, um, who adamantly insisted that Jefferson write it since he was both a Virginian and a better writer. So this is a pretty cool aspect, like, most people, when they were talking about writing the Declaration, you either wanted Jefferson to do it or you wanted Adams to do it because they were both super smart, really good writers. Adams kind of conceded that Jefferson was the intellectual superior and a better writer, and Virginia was kind of like the spot of American colonies. That was where like a lot of the power was held and a lot of the people's voice was or a lot of people in Virginia. So Adams felt that a Virginian should be the one to write it to represent the largest majority of the people that wanted this independence um which yeah is pretty cool and it's kind of just and we'll get more into adams as well but it's kind of just that little occurrence kind of just shows man people were different back then if you and i if you and, and i were talking about writing the tumultuous document for a new country that would potentially last hundreds of years and define a nation and its people. I think you and I would like kind of be at each other's throats over like, who got to write it. Oh, oh, like not necessarily you and I, but people who thought of themselves as the person who would oh, do a good see, job. Yeah. So if you and I were both great writers and we thought we'd do a good job at it, we might not be at each other's throats, but we at least partially would be kind of like, yeah. I mean, yeah, dude, you'd be good, but like, I mean, I'd be good. <laughs> so like, you want to like duel for it? See, Whoever gets be, shot doesn't like, write it. You got that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's how Adams was, like yeah. partially to not have the responsibility, but also, and maybe it's not a great pressure, example, but there was know, just too. a lot more like honor and chivalry and like whatever is yeah. best right now is what we should do. And Adams genuinely thought that Jefferson writing the declaration would have been best for everybody. So he takes that on. All right. After drafting the Declaration of Independence, he suggested that the American motto be rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And that's a pretty sick line. I just wrote that down that on for that arm. reason. It's pretty sick, dude. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And that is how they viewed George III. How'd that, how'd that get lost? That's not... Well, interestingly enough... Um, okay, so I don't have a particular note about this, but there were a lot of things in Jefferson's original draft of the Declaration right. that they took out. And to go back to our original conversation, I said we'd, get, we'd hit it throughout this video, and we will... Jefferson had stuff in the Declaration about abolishing slavery. In the Declaration of Independence, in 1776, freaking almost 100 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, he had put stuff in the Declaration about abolishing slavery. He basically said, if we do this, like, 
it's got to be for everybody. So we can't have slavery anymore. Yeah. And then obviously they debated for like a long time going back and forth about what should be kept in it and all that stuff about, there's not a mention of slavery in the declaration of independence as you all probably know, because it yeah. took the emancipation proclamation to get what we needed. And then further stuff after that. But so yeah, it's actually very interesting. Like early on in his life, this dude owns like freaking 98 slaves. And he's like, just talking about how this is really bad. And if we're going to talk about how, humans have inalienable rights <laughs> then we can't have slaves and the rest of a lot of the others were like i think we'll just keep this for the whites <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna take that part out because you know we still uh, need the south to produce what it's, it's like producing. Right, we set them free then what women get to vote like? <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> what's gonna ah, happen ah, next ah, ah. oh my gosh um uh, that's good. so anyway uh they write the declaration um uh, kind of the next biggest thing I had in his life was he turned down the selection to be an ambassador to France to secure relations between France and America. Um, he mainly does this due to his wife's health um, and the fact that she couldn't travel. But So he had traveled over there before? Not yet. Not yet in his so he life. He had never been to Europe? No, not at this point, no. Mm -hmm. He had never been. He does end up going to France, but not yet. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is actually another reoccurring thing in Jefferson's life. Um, and it's kind of complicated, but... He turns down being an envoy to France three different times before he ends up doing it. Um, and then he also, and we'll get to it later, he ends up retiring during Washington's, uh, at the beginning of Washington's second uh, term. And uh, there's a couple different instances where he just like wants to walk away from political life. Um, and it's kind of a cool thing. Part of it's a little bit of a ploy because back then it was very like, like, it was not cool to be seen as a guy who wanted a political position. So, like, back then, yeah. dude, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, James Madison, Monroe, Quincy, I don't think, I don't even think Jackson, until, like, after the first handful of presidents, there was no campaigning. You didn't say a word about it. Like, in private correspondence, you might mention, like, I wouldn't mind being president, but yeah. you didn't campaign, you didn't say anything publicly, you didn't put nothing in a newspaper. But all that to say, like, there was a little bit of that of just being, like, you know, con being the way you were supposed to be politically by not looking like you wanted something. And they use the term vanity for that a lot, which is basically looking like you wanted a certain position or a certain type of power. But just in general, it seemed like Jefferson very often, either because, you know, he said a bunch of different things. So it could have been due to him not thinking he was cut out for it or him just not liking politics. And he would rather just be on his farm riding his horse and having yeah. sex with his slaves, whatever it was. Um, <laughs> a great American past. I mean, <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Jesus. Cut that, Johnny. <laughs> um, so anyway, he turns down the first time that he selected being ambassador to France. Um, around this time in his life, he becomes really good friends with James Madison, who would later succeed him as president. He ended up being the fourth president of the United States. Um, Jefferson was 33 around this time. Madison was like eight years younger. So, this ends up being like his closest political ally throughout the rest of his life and kind of like his pupil in a way. Um, Wait, so Madison was in his early 20s when he became president? No, no, no. This is when they became friends. Oh, this I was is when Jefferson say, was 33 was and Madison not? was 25. Okay, I didn't know if no, they're still like the 40 years of... away from either one of them becoming president. Oh, they okay. But you're saying they knew each other before. Yeah, they met each other. This is like still like this is right around. This is right after the Declaration of Independence is gotcha. when they meet each other and become friends. Um Dang, so Madison was in his early 20s and, like, having a big impact. Yeah, he was on the scene in his 20s, bro. Bro, can you imagine right now? I mean, I just can you imagine putting yourself in Thomas Jefferson's shoes right no. now at this point? You're in, be, going back to whenever Thomas Jefferson was 28 and whatever was going no. on. And not only knowing, like, I guess you having the foresight to know, I better perform. Because if not, we may not make it. <laughs> This whole entire country might not make it. Or just, yeah, that history rests on. I mean, obviously, I don't know yeah. if he felt that weight. It's actually an in interesting thing that you bring up. They did, dude. People like Washington and Adams and Jefferson especially, and again, some of those the other pressure, founding fathers, yeah. fathers, they knew that whatever they did would be – if they basically – and there, there's, there's a lot of comments throughout this book and the Adams and Washington books I've read. They would say stuff to each other and be like, if America works out, a hundred years from now, we're the guys they're going to be talking about. So whatever we do, it's going to be judged by posterity for like the remainder of this country's existence. So man, that's some serious pressure, dude. Yeah. When you're thinking about it in that way. And they also had the attitude of like, 
we're going to do what we think is right. They're never going to be able to talk to us about it and actually know what it was like in this time, which again is a very insightful thing to understand is that no matter what we do, it's he, Jefferson literally has a quote where he's like, no matter what I do in different times throughout the future, it's going to be looked at differently. And none of them are ever going to really know what it was like. So yeah. I'm just going to have to take it on the chin because I'll oh, be yeah. dead. Um, if you could bring Thomas Jefferson to 2023 right now and show him one thing, what would it be? I'd probably show him a Doja Cat music video. <laughs> He'd, be like, He'd be like, bro, where is she at? Can I buy her? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he would say. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, can you imagine him pulling up to... I don't know, like an NFL game and trying to explain the NFL to Thomas Jefferson. He'd be like, are they trying to declare their independence? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. He'd be dude. so confused. Um, so uh, going on from there, uh, one thing that he worked hard was uh, on religious freedom. And he actually had some really cool like perspectives on this. So throughout his life, Jefferson was accused of being an atheist Nowadays, we more like refer that Jefferson Bible, where he cut out. Yeah, dude, he like took out parts, rewrote certain parts, like all this kind of stuff. Um, nowadays, history more views him as like a deist or a deist, whatever you would say, where he essentially believed in a god, but he didn't believe in Jesus being God, all that kind of it's stuff. Tough, dude, we're not going to be able to see old TJ in heaven. I mean, I, mean, I might see him in hell. <laughs> <laughs> My boy! <laughs> What's up, dude? What's up, Sally? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just you kidding. Mean, Sally's in heaven. Yeah, um, she better be. But uh, so it was really interesting. Like, and there were a lot of people. It, there's a lot to suggest that Washington did not believe that Jesus was, was God. Um, but they all wanted the Bible to be like... Not necessarily, they didn't want everybody to be a Christian. There were people like that in America. They that, just believed in the truths of like yeah, what, they, what they, kind of person it makes. If yes. You, yeah. They wanted to follow the morality of the Christ yeah. is essentially what they believed in. They wanted to base like American beliefs very heavily in the Bible, which is why one nation founded under God is a part of our, whatever you call it, the national anthem. Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Say the Pledge of Allegiance anthem. right now. What's Allegiance. the first word? I to pledge allegiance to the flag of the, of the United, United States, States of America. Of America. Into the Republic. For which it stands. One nation. On earth and in heaven that will be done. <laughs> you were close. And deliver us. <laughs> Say it. Sorry, I just went to Spider-Man. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> oh, man. But anyway, he was big on religious freedom, which was not a thing in the colonies and wasn't a thing in early America necessarily. Like it was a thing in the declaration, but it was a struggle for a lot of people because there were a lot of ministers and all these people who would like, I mean, I mean, they'd rather people be dead than not follow the Bible, but Jefferson made some really good arguments. And one of the ones that he made that was pretty cool. I wish I had like, I have a picture of it and I'll try at some point to like go through the pictures I took of certain quotes from the book and mention some of them. But he essentially says at one point in writing a letter to this minister He's like, if your God is who you say he is, he does not need you to enact a law to defend him. If he's God, then he's God. He will do as he pleases. As men, we do not need to enact additional laws that are not part of you know what you claim to believe in in order to make people believe this. If he's God, he's God. So it was a pretty cool like perspective he had to give people freedom of religion. Like, yeah. Um, and and for the times, it was pretty. I'd say progressive in comparison to a lot of the, you know, colonial Americans who were oh, pretty, yeah. pretty legalistic, hardcore, like Bible thumpers. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, moving on from that, uh, he succeeded Patrick Henry as the governor of Virginia. Uh, he was governor for two years, uh, narrowly defeated John Page in the race, but the two remain good friends. So John Page is a correspondent you hear a lot from in Jefferson's life, another political figure. Um, and that's 1779 to 81. So we're already deep in the Revolutionary War. And in this book, when you read about Thomas Jefferson, like they'll mention like, you know, you'll read about the Declaration of Independence and then some stuff goes by and you don't really hear about the war itself, like battles or these kind of things for the most part. And then it'll be like, yeah. And then in 1779, he became governor of Virginia. And they're like, wait, the Revolutionary War has just been going on. And it's because Jefferson was not militarily involved at all. This dude yeah. was not a soldier. All right. He was a reader. He was a writer and he was a thinker more than anything. Um, a cool quote was that someone else said to him late in his life was, 
essentially George Washington fought for us. Um, and I may be butchering it a little bit, but I'll get the point across. George Washington fought for us. John Adams spoke for us, but you thought for us. And that's how people saw Jefferson as like the mm-hmm. tumultuous thinker. Like he could just put words on paper and describe like what he wanted to achieve and what Americans truly wanted out of independence better than anybody could. He was just a master at putting Hamilton things loved to words. That about him. Bro, Hamilton did not like him. <laughs> Hamilton. Have you seen Hamilton? No, and I'm so curious to see it, dude, because I feel like they might have butchered his life. Like, dude, you haven't seen it, mm-mm. bro. It's so good. I've heard it's amazing. Dude, I saw, honestly, I, we should watch it after this. I'm so serious. I'm down. It's on I, Disney Plus. I heard this comedian talking about how uh, my dad was telling me this the other day, and then I looked it up. This comedian did a bit about how he and his wife went to see Hamilton. He was like, "Man, we got halfway through and went to the intermission. I looked at my wife and I said, "Do you want to go? You want to leave?" And she was like, "Yeah." And he was like, "I didn't know what was going on." He said, "I walked to that theater and looked at my wife and said." I feel so stupid. I had no idea Hamilton was black. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hamilton was white. It was Jefferson and George I Washington know. are black. I know, but he's just making a joke oh, about okay. how they made people that weren't weren't black black in that play. Yeah. Which is, no one cares. Who cares? But yeah. it was just a funny bit. I'm not a comedian. Who so. was that? I don't know. I can't remember his name. I mean, that is funny. It's just, it, dude, you would, I can't, dude, it's, no, it's based off of, the biography. I mean, yeah, no. I have the biography it's based off of that I haven't read that's also written by Ron Chernow who wrote the Great Washington one. Um, Wait, so it, Ron Chernow wrote Alexander Hamilton? Wow. Dude, why have you not seen that? Dude, you, you're you going to love it. I'm, I'm sure I would. First of all, I freaking hate musicals. Uh, I, see, I love, hate. I love musicals. Bro, I loathe Dude, musical. Lexi doesn't like musical either. You Have you never seen like well, the Well, Taylor Greatest likes Showman? musicals, so... Maybe you and Taylor should hang out sometime, and me and Lexi will while y'all go watch a freaking like, musical. Wait, have you ever seen The Greatest Showman? No, dude. Hugh I'm Jackson's musical, great in that. Bro. If people start singing in a movie, I turn it off. I'm done. You I'm not watching a movie to watch people sing. You should not love it like you used to, man. <laughs> God, dude. Yeah, turn that that yik yak. But I, from what I've off. heard about the Hamilton play, I feel like they kind of didn't get a lot of stuff very correct about him because Hamilton was like Hamilton was really smart. He did a lot of important stuff, but Hamilton was kind of a fool also. Like Hamilton was a monarchist. Like he would have rather seen a king on the throne of America than a president. And he talks about it a lot. There's a lot of references to it in this book. I'm interested to read Chernow's book on him so I can get a different perspective because you definitely, whenever you're reading a biography about any figure, especially that far back. You have to assume that the author is writing about someone that they respect and they think is very important. So any of the opponents in that figure's life, again, a historian like John Meacham, I'm not saying he does this, but you can sometimes maybe get the feeling that they're talking, not badly, but they're referring to figures that oppose the person that they're writing a book about in lesser terms. So like Hamilton and Adams both get a couple of shots fired at them in this book. Like not outright, but you read a couple things and you're like, and you walk away from it thinking less of Adams or less of Hamilton because you're getting the perspective of Jefferson, yeah. which this guy does do a really good point of pointing out. Now, Hamilton was right about this and Adams was right about this. And again, he doesn't say it outright. No, he never says, oh, he was right. But he presents it in a way to like show both differing sides. But Hamilton was a monarchist. Well, he was a big government guy. Yeah. He's he, a very big government guy. Whereas he's state government guy. Yeah, That's he was, but there were some interesting things like, he really was more of a combination of federalism and republicanism than people realize because he did, bro, he extended the, the executive office powers when he was president a couple times. Like, he yeah. did some things that were unconstitutional. He kind of had to, but it's just, you know, when you actually get in the seat and you have to make the decisions, you go, oh, you yeah. kind of do need a little more Dude, power every you, now and you're then. You're going to like it. The only I'm sure I will. Because Jefferson doesn't get flamed in... Who gets flamed? Aaron Burr, bro. Oh, Aaron Burr's a... Aaron- Dude, he's the one. He'd be flip flopping, dog. Whatever side could get him in office. He yeah, was dude. Like, he was oh, a here and over here. hardcore so Jeffersonian, gets- and then next thing you know, he's a Federalist and yeah. like trying to like run around and like get Missouri or some piece of land to secede. That's like not even part yeah. of America. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was crazy. Dude, and then he ends up killing Hamilton. Yeah, the old duel. But it's just um, <clears throat> a vice not, president. You- of, I mean, people don't realize that a vice president of the United States committed murder. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. in a duel yeah. over some like, you know, Petty mean stuff. words. Yeah. Um, Which I mean, no, but I mean, it's, 
because it's not like a, I mean, it, it shows definitely Hamilton's weaknesses too, but it does a good job, I think, too, with Washington and showing, like, how Washington doesn't necessarily, I mean, again, I haven't, like, read as much as you have on Washington, but he, like, didn't want to be there. And, like, how, like, he's mm-hmm. like, all right, but I need you and you and you. Like, he was basically the great organizer to use mm-hmm. people's different talents. Yep. Um, he's so good at to it. To achieve good things. Um, but not letting them kind of run away with things that they that weren't yeah. on t- on topic, um, and so anyway, like because that's he's kind of the mediator between them two. Yeah, and again, two, that's but. that's why when Adams became president, it was so tough because not only did people essentially worship Washington, but especially yeah. the people in the government knew like Washington is what is holding us all together. Jefferson and Hamilton want to freaking kill each other, dude. Who Washington would be in modern times now is either like Nick Saban or freaking Bill Belichick. <laughs> A great Dude, leader I, I hate you for just comparing Washington to freaking college Dude, football Dude, he would have won 19 national <laughs> Dude, championships. I, I hate you so much. <laughs> Dude, I do not want to do this podcast anymore. <laughs> oh, But you're right. You're completely right. And there's a really cool quote as well during Washington's presidency where, you know, because really more so because of some of the people around him like Hamilton, he starts being seen as a monarchist, Washington, and people start to kind of whisper about him wanting to, like, be the king of America. And he in like a meeting with a bunch of his like cabinet one day they bring in this article from a newspaper where they were accusing him of you know wanting to turn america into a monarchy and he like who's this hamilton no this is washington Washington when he's president and he like flies into a rage this is right before jefferson leaves so this is during his second term as president washington like flies off the handle starts screaming and he says a quote that's written by many different people that were there so you know this is the accurate quote he says I would rather be on my farm living a simple life than be crowned emperor of the world and still these people say these things about me. So it's a really cool thing to see that like so much was put on his character that was correct and incorrect, good and bad. And he was just a good man. Yeah. That like didn't want like truly believed in the American dream of like liberty and a and a free republic. But couldn't escape yeah, because of how much he was loved. He couldn't escape like the 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 conversation of him wanting to be king. But it's only because the peop- the American people applied so much to him and revered him as a king. Yeah. And there's also the factor of like they had all come from a monarchy. They had come from an empire that had been a monarchy for hundreds of years or however long. So it's also all they knew. So it was easy for people to slip into the mindset and see kind of everything as yeah. being monarchical which Jefferson was a pretty paranoid guy about that. He started to see a lot of things that really weren't monarchical designs as, you know, them trying to make things into a monarchy. So, yeah. Anyways, dude, I'm loving this. We're really getting into the, into the founding. But it's good to know too, that, you know, as like you were saying with Jefferson extending some of his powers, I'm sure like one of the ones you're going to bring up is the Louisiana purchase, which was completely unconstitutional. Oh yeah. But I mean, tripled the size of America. So I mean, you got to do it, but 100% was that the AC turning on and off or did it just rain for one and a half seconds? I didn't hear anything. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, we'll we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. 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 We'll get to that. But, um, yeah, and I, I've said this before, I think, in a video, but because we don't have a full video on that Ron Chernow book of Washington, I will just say, like, Washington is the guy. Yeah. Like, Washington led the American military to victory in the Revolutionary War and handed all of his power back to the American people when he could have easily just said the word. I mean, the way they talk about it back then, Washington, Washington could have done absolutely whatever he wanted when the revolutionary war was over he could have said okay i am king now he could have and people would have been like yeah i mean you're god basically so yeah yeah he turned across that delaware delaware river i mean it was it was a wrap after that it was a wrap dude people were like he's jesus yep like he is the guy and they're like he's like (laughs) he's like no 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 we're not there yet (laughs) stop Oh man, that's rough, dude. I mean, the things that we have said and the fact that you just hiled in this video. I mean, we're yeah, never, but I, we're never but I was George monetized. Washington. <laughs> <laughs> never once. It was a historical joke. Come on, oh, man. come on, man. Um, okay, so where am I at? Uh, so yeah, he becomes governor of Virginia in 1779. So this is during the Revolutionary War. So during the Revolutionary War, Benedict Arnold was mm. an American who betrayed America. Hate him, uh, and. 
after his betrayal and after he ends up getting back with England and starts, you know, becomes a general for them in the English army, the British army, he invades Virginia. Now, this is one of the, like, one of the bigger blots on Jefferson's, like, record and, like, his history. So, uh, Jefferson lost Richmond to Benedict Arnold during the British invasion of Virginia in the war. He mistakenly did not call militia to arms in time for any meaningful response and therefore lost the capital. So, Jefferson's, like, <clears throat> at Monticello. And there had been a ton of rumors over the last three years of the British invading Virginia, and it never happened. So, yeah. once he started receiving reports of Benedict Ar Arnold and his army being in Virginia, he didn't believe him in time it was like to a respond. Crying wolf type of thing. It's a crying wolf thing until he looks through his spyglass like, and sees the British army closing in on Monticello. So, yeah. uh, it ended up being like a mark on him. It obviously didn't hurt him too bad because he served two terms as president not long, you know, not too long after this or, you know, a couple decades, but whatever. Um, there was an inquiry into Jefferson's actions uh, in, in the, at the, whoa. There was an inquiry into Jefferson's actions in the end of his tenure as governor when Arnold invaded, invaded Virginia, but there was also an inquiry into whether or not the governorship was given the proper power to respond accordingly. His character coming into question cut a deep wound. So this was a big thing. Deep wound. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, all these guys, like anything that was a mark on their character or could be perceived as like them being a lesser person and like their reputation being torn up a little bit was like the worst thing that could possibly happen to them. Yeah. And it wasn't even just for political reasons. It was just because that's who they were. Like being misunderstood or being seen as like not in like a, a hardcore, you know, American was a huge mark. So for him to go through this inquiry was really tough for him. He did mess up. Again, he wasn't a military guy. And the inquiries, you know, they obviously didn't, you know, resolve anything that ended in him being in trouble. Um but there was a separate inquiry where they basically decided, like, you know, Jefferson maybe didn't respond to this properly, but did we even, like, did we even bestow the proper amount of power on him during war for him to have responded differently? Because he kind of just essentially had to go through a lot of channels to even raise a militia, which during wartime, that seems crazy. If you're, war if you're operating in a country that's made up of states that have their own power and their own militias, and the governor doesn't have the power to just say, okay, go here you kind of messed up. So yeah. it is one of the things that he ends up, I mean, he gets reminded of it throughout his career a lot and it was always something that was really tough for him to hear about. But again, it doesn't seem like there was probably more he could have done, but it doesn't seem like there was so much more that he could have done that it wouldn't have ended the same way. Essentially yeah. can never know, but that's kind of how it played out and how people saw it. So, uh, he was all, he was, not seen in a great light to yet again decline ambassadorship to France after his term as governor was up. He opted to live with his family and planned to read books, seemingly retiring. So this is one of those points in his life where, again, Martha, who we called Patty, his wife, her health isn't great. She's had a lot of children. Most of them haven't lived. And he just, at this time, like, it's kind of hard to, like, fully understand his thinking because this is during the revolution. And he's supposed to be one of the one of the guys it's like him Washington Adams like he's one of the three dudes that all of the colonists all the colonies look to as like their leaders and he's sitting there going nah I think I just want to go home and read and hang out with my family so it is one of those things you just wonder like man maybe he really didn't want to be involved in this political stuff but he just kept yeah. getting drawn back into it because of his his genius mind and his ability to like you know articulate ideas and lead people so then we jump to uh, after 10 years of marriage, Patty dies. Uh, his grief was insurmountable. He suffered fainting and frenzied fits, seemingly contemplated suicide, and was rumored to have gone mad. He endured for his children. Uh, he and Patsy, which was his daughter who was 10 years old, became even closer during this time and would have a great bond throughout their lives. So it's essentially what it says. He like All of his friends were talking about it after his wife died. They were like, yo, like I know this is tough, but I didn't think he would get this bad. Like He was doing wacky stuff like... He'd be out riding his horse for like 12 hours a day and they would just be like, where is dad? And then he would come home and like not talk to his kids. Like he would have these crazy headaches. He would like, they'd go into his room sometimes and he'd just be laying on the floor, like staring up at the ceiling. So he clearly battled some serious grief mm. when his wife died, which obviously is super tough. Um, Cause she basically, I mean, they were only married for 10 years and she spent the majority of that 10 years pregnant and only two of the kids survived at this yeah. point. 
Um, and he loved his wife. You know, you get a bit, I didn't make any notes on it, but he loved his wife a whole lot. Um, so he was, was the all Sally about it. Hemings thing, was that while his wife was alive or is that after? She never got pregnant while his wife was alive. Mm. So it's hard to know it's if anything else was going on. I don't actually think, I don't know if, if she was around yet. Yeah, she. I think she was, but she would have been really young. I mean, I hope there was nothing going on. She would have been really young at the time, if I remember correctly. Um, okay, so after uh, Patty dies, uh, he finally uh, does accept being an envoy to France. <laughs> but the one time he accepts, he ends up getting sent home before he even gets there because then the Treaty of Paris gets signed. Um, shortly after that, he is elected to the National Congress where a weak government was the major concern. So this is a big recurring theme in this time of America right after the Revolutionary War is essentially over is that the government is just completely ineffectual, that they don't have the power to actually do anything. Yeah. So that's like a big thing that you see throughout these early years. And Jefferson was a big part of that and obviously saw that as a major issue. Uh, and then uh, after he's elected to the National Congress, he is again elected alongside Benjamin Franklin and John Adams to go to Paris to secure alliances for the new nation. All the while, Congress still seemed weak and ineffectual. Um, during this time, he becomes really close to John Abigail and John Quincy and even Nabby Adams, their daughter, while they're in France. So this is it's actually a really interesting thing because the relationship between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson is like a roller coaster throughout their whole lives. At this point, they become very close to the point where Adams at one point said to Jefferson, like, my son, John Quincy, sees you as like a father as much as he sees me as one. So they were super, super tight. Mm. And again, they, they had a lot more. They hadn't gotten deep enough into American government and politics because they had just finished the Revolutionary War. So they hadn't got deep enough into the, the weeds to realize that they were politically pretty different on some things. So early on, they're super close. Like I mentioned in, my, uh, in our video about the John Adams book, Abigail was like super smart as well and very involved and very well informed. So she ends up being very, very close to Jefferson. They all correspond a lot throughout their lives until there's the falling out and then they become friends again. Um, this is also when the saga with the Tripoli pirates began um, while he's over in France. This is essentially, I don't know if you know much about mm. this, but the Barbary States like Malta and Tripoli and all these places, they were basically harassing like all these merchant ships, Britain, uh, America and pretty much any other country that was running ships through their area. And what all the other countries were doing was giving them like in today's money, like billions of dollars so that they wouldn't mess with their ships. And so that's more stuff comes up later down the line, but that's kind of when this all started is when American merchant ships start getting harassed by these Tripoli pirates. And Jefferson is immediately like, yo, that cannot happen and we're not giving them money. So we need to figure something out. Um, so pretty interesting that started there. Uh, while he's in France, uh, he has, uh, does he have Patsy with him at this time? Yeah, he has Patsy with him. So he has one of his three daughters that are alive right now. Um, but during this time while he's in France, his daughter Lucy died of whooping cough. Sad. Whooping cough? Whooping. Whooping. W-H-O-O-P-I-N-G. What is that? I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know what it is, but you can still get whooping cough today. Like it's pretty, it's pretty bad if babies get it. So back then, if they got it, it's like, oh, it's oh you're gonna like die. Infants get. Yeah, it's something kids get, and it's yeah. it's called that because they get a horrible cough. And it was actually pretty savage. This part of the book, like, he's in France, dude. He hadn't seen his daughter in who knows how long. Last time he saw her, he thought he'd see her again when he returned, and then he just gets a letter saying she died. And the lady, it was like his his brother or his sister or somebody he was related to was watching his kids and like educating them and making sure they were good. The woman, either his sister or sister-in-law sends him a letter saying like, you know, she died peacefully and you know, it was really rough. But when she passed, it was this bro, his brother or brother-in-law sent him and literally said, I have never seen someone <laughs> go through something worse than that in my life. <laughs> Talking about his daughter dying of whooping cough because their daughter died too. the people who had like both oh, these God. daughters died and the the guy who also lost his daughter tells Jefferson, like, bro, our daughters suffered. Just so you know, Hope France is lit. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> like, it was rough, man. Like, it was super rough. Like, the woman was trying to let him yeah. down easy, and the guy was like, bro, you're grieving with me. Our daughters were in pain when they died. So that was super rough. Um, and, like, neither one of us have children right now, but, like. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Oh, God. That's 
that's good. But I was at this point in the book, I remember being on the phone with my dad and like briefly mentioning this part of it. And my dad was just talking about, he was like, man, there's no way for you to like understand this right now in your life. But like to be that far away, like in that time it was different. Kids did die a lot more. So maybe it was a little less of a blow, but he was like, he was like, I can't imagine uh, yeah. being a continent away and just getting a letter that your daughter died of a horrible whooping cough and she's gone. You will never, the last time you saw her when you left, that was the last time you'd ever see her. And so it's just like kind of crazy to think about how different it was, man. Like yeah. we can't even, we really can't even compute like what it is. If you want to go to another country, you can go. There's a good chance you'll die on the way, but also you're not going to hear from anybody until about six months to a year after it happened. So if you get a letter, they done wrote that, they done wrote that and about 45 other letters for you already. And they're just making their way across the pond. So it's just different, man. It was just, it, it's so hard to compute. And that's another thing that makes the presidency itself very interesting that I, that I thought about during this book. So, you know, the term limits weren't a thing until after FDR, yeah. like after World War II. But everybody except FDR honored that only two terms would be like the thing because Washington set that precedent. But when you think about it, in that time, bro, it took months and months and months to get one thing passed and going because you got to wait for everybody to travel to Congress you got to wait for all the letters to get dispatched and responded to. That alone can take months. So four years as a president in the founding era was not what four years as a president yeah, now is. it's tough to get stuff done. Well, it was tough to get stuff done, but it was also like, it was still referred to as the most stressful thing a man could possibly do was being president of the United States of America. But there was way less that you could possibly get done because everything just took way longer. Yeah. Like way longer. When you send an envoy to France to secure an alliance, they might have secured it three months ago, but you don't know because you haven't got the freaking letter yet. But yeah. nowadays, like things are happening in real time. So it kind of makes you think, bro, should presidents only be presidents for like five weeks now? <laughs> because so <laughs> much goes down. <laughs> like, yeah. it's just kind of crazy to think how much that empowers the presidency, like the executive office and government in general because things can happen so much more quickly. But it also is scary because back then, if like a bill was being negotiated in Congress or like some leg legislative action, whatever it was, like whether or not to go to war, the people can read about it in the papers for... The people can read about it in the papers for like six months before anything's going to happen and everybody can kind of voice their opinion. You can get a, an idea of how people feel about it. Whereas now, like stuff just happens, dude. Or bro... Like the War of 1812, mm -hmm. and when our boy Andrew Jack, well, maybe not our boy, <laughs> Andrew Jackson, the Battle of New Orleans, bro, the war was already over, mm -hmm. if I yeah. remember correctly. It was. It just took time for those letters to get there. So yeah. people died when the war mm -hmm. was already over. Was that, wait, was that not the Revolutionary War? That was the War of 1812. You're right. War of 1812. You're right. Yeah. yeah, he was in Louisiana. He was in New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans and yeah. he had the Battle of New Orleans when the war was over, bro. So all those he, people he won, just died. But he won. it didn't matter. He won and he was hype. And then he got a letter saying so, the war ended like yesterday. And he was just like, let's not tell anybody about that <laughs> until I'm gone. <laughs> but um, so anyway, moving on. Um. So Lucy dies. Uh, Adams was sent to London as envoy to Great Britain. Jefferson remained as the sole envoy to France and Paris. He loved France. He bought lots of art and materials there and loved the countryside. Francais. Visited Adams in London, and this is when they had their fabled garden tour over the course of three days. So this is something I read about in the Adams book as well. Um, this was just like, I say fabled because you just, I feel like I read about this and everything I read about the Founding Fathers is that in London... When Adams was there as the ambassador or envoy, Jefferson travels from Paris and they just have these three magical days where they just talk about like their love of country, the ideas, the diplomacy, all the different things. And it seemed kind of like the mountaintop of their relationship when they were just really boys and really synced up. So kind of just an interesting time. Um, so he writes a letter to Maria Cosway, who he seemingly fell in love with for about a month, of a conversation between his head and his heart in which he explored the contradictions of human impulses and his own emotional depths and fear. So I'm not going to read this whole thing, but if you're watching this and you have any interest, this is one of the most compelling things I've ever seen written by a person from this time. He writes this lady a letter, and she's freaking married. Jefferson kind of did this a few times, bro. He's kind of a player. But she's married, and he like basically is in love with her, and... 
he writes this letter and the letter is basically a conversation between his head and his heart and going back and forth about like his impulses and like what his mind thinks is the right thing to do, but what his heart, you know, wants. And dude, it's fascinating to see. And it, and it kind of shows you why Jefferson was revered as the guy he was because dude, he just was a genius with putting the human mind and heart and the human problem on paper and you being able to go, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it's like. Yeah. And it's crazy to read. He wrote it 200 years ago, and you're still to this day like, yeah, that's what we're like. That's bars. It's bars, bro. You trying to get Metro booming on that? <laughs> like, dang, cuh. So uh, if you're interested in hearing more about that, that's not one of the things I'm going to quote from the book. I do have something in particular that I will quote from the book, but look up The Head and the Heart by Thomas Jefferson, and you'll find it. Um so in France, Jefferson impregnated Sally Hemings, whom he would Wait, father. Wait, she came to France? Yeah, and I've, once I say this, dude, there's a crazy thing about that. But So while he was in France, he impregnated Sally Hemings, whom he would father four children with. Uh, she initially wanted to remain in France when it was time to leave because she was technically free in France. But Jefferson convinced her to return to Virginia, Virginia upon his promise that all of her children would be freed at the age of 21, which they were. But it's still, looking back, it's like, dang dude that is rough be like look come back with me and i'll free your children after 21 years of Makes slavery it sound like i'll she didn't free want to be with our him. children no dude she didn't want to be with them bro she didn't on. love him so one of the things this guy says so sally hemmings if you don't know was a slave who there's no photos of her that survived history but was reportedly a beautiful girl and from a pretty young age, unfortunately, there seems to have been a relationship that Thomas Jefferson had with her. Now, John Meacham makes a good point to say, look, there's no way for us to know for sure. This could have been love. It could have been coercion. It could have been borderline rape. Who knows? But yeah. the only reason, the only thing that you have to defend or, or combat that with is that people like Madison Hemings, one of her sons and a few other ones, did refer to Jefferson in a fairly good light for the most part. Um, and she also, once Jefferson died, she had kept some mementos of Jefferson that she ended up passing down to her children. And she also, like, you know, was a part of his life until he died. So you, you could say that that might be an argument to say that she really did at least have feelings for him or care about him. But again, we're talking about we're talking about the 1700s when life was different. I mean, if you were a slave, yeah. I can't even remotely imagine what it felt like. So she might not have felt that she really could get away with, you know, yeah, doing anything other no. than just listening to him. Yeah. Because, you know, she was free in France, free to do what she wanted in France technically, but I imagine in the back of her head she was like, "Well, what am I going to do? I don't have money and I'm pregnant." So I'm sure to her it was like, "Okay, if he's giving me a promise that all my children will eventually be free, I mean, getting freed by the age of 21, as shit as that sounds for a man to do to his own children, as far as Sally, Sally Hemings' perspective goes, it was better than being a slave for life. So yeah. as far as she could see it, she was like, well, dang, that's freaking great. They're going to be free way before I probably will, which she got her freedom once Jefferson died, which, again, is just so messed up. It's <laughs> like, you'll be free when I'm dead, woman. It's like, dang, dude. Um, but... Mm. All that to say, the funny story, I say funny, it's really messed up. So the reason she was in France is after Lucy dies, Jefferson wants his other daughter, Polly. So he's only got two dollar, two children left at this point. He's got Patsy, who's already with him in France, and then Polly is still over in Virginia. Um, so once Lucy dies, he wants Polly to come over. So um, she tra Sally Hemings travels with Polly. As like basically, you know, her servant nanny, or whatever. Okay, yeah, and yeah. nanny, yeah, because she is older than Polly as well. The captain of the ship that brings them to France. <laughs> so Abigail Adams, John Adams' wife, is the one that receives them in France, if I remember correctly, or maybe somewhere else until they got to France. Yeah, it was somewhere else. Maybe it was England, probably, before they get to France. Abigail writes Jefferson a letter, and it's like, so yeah, this girl that came with Polly, like, the captain like once like doesn't think she's fit for sea travel and like feels like she's not a very like good servant and he just wants to take her. <laughs> so this captain dude, he has there's a letter from him where he's like, 
basically to paraphrase and put it in modern terms, he's like, yeah, man, I don't think she's really worth it. So like, I'll take her. So from yeah, I'll really just take her off your hands, man. I'm going to like, you know, take her back home. And it's just like blat- the most blatant example of this guy. And it kind of just points to the fact that apparently a lot of people thought she was beautiful and like, I guess, liked to be around her because this guy wanted to take her. Yeah. Like wanted him to become his, you know, little little thing, little boo thing. So kind of just an interesting thing. Like, again, it shows the depravity of slavery. They did see these people as objects and they were like, yo, can I get this one? Like, she doesn't seem that useful. Let me get her. Um, so it's super messed up, but it's also just kind of alludes to the fact that like Sally was a girl to be wanted, apparently, at whatever yeah. age this was. So um, I'm going to see where we're at right now. Keep going. Oh, yeah. So, to kind of get off, we'll come back to Sally a little bit later. Um, what are we at? About 120. Oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> we got a ways to go. He's not even president yet. He's not even vice president <laughs> Dude, that's yet. What I was thinking. Well, I'm about to speed it up a little bit. So, Washington this is Franklin. Good, though, so we can save him. Yeah. Washington, Franklin, Adams, and others sent Jefferson copies of the new Constitution and asked his thoughts. He was initially displeased and agreed with Adams that a Bill of Rights was needed but eventually saw the good in the Constitution alone and expected that changes would be made made as needed in the future. Um, And this is right before the French Revolution begins. So essentially, it's what I just said. Jefferson was always, like, nitpicky about, like, human rights and, like, making sure that everything that needed to be there was there. And the Constitution alone didn't have it. That's why we do have the Bill of Rights. But he essentially ended up deciding, like, okay, we're not going to keep going back and forth and haggling especially while I'm in France and can't even get this information until way after the fact. So like, I agree, just do it as you have it. And as stuff comes up, we will get better. I I can't remember the constitution. I can't. Dude, you know, I can say the preamble by heart. Do it right now. We, the people in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for a common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our prosperity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Wow, dude, that was impressive. <laughs> Are you trying to be president? The only reason I know that is because of Schoolhouse Rock. Oh, so I'm yeah, like yeah, yeah. It in my head. We the people. I wish you would just sing it. You know what? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I was in my mind. It was a grind if you not to. Oh, man. All right. That's so the, forever locked in there. That's what's wild. I mean, yeah, you ripped that, um, which that thing was great for learning as a kid, oh. the schoolhouse rock. Like, it really it really did teach you what was up. But um, so the French Revolution begins. Uh, the French Constitution was heavily influenced by the Declaration, and its writer, Lafayette, sought, ca- sought counsel from so he's Jefferson well. when writing drafts. Marquis Lafayette, mm-hmm. yeah. He's a big player in it. Yeah, he's a huge player uh, throughout all that stuff. Um. So, yeah, he's writing Jefferson, like, while they're writing the French Constitution, which there was another name for the French Constitution at the time, and I can't remember it right now. But, anyway, just kind of uh, alluding to the fact that Jefferson was still seen as, like, the dude. Like, if you're trying to independence yourself, reach out to Jefferson. He'll help you out. Um, Late 1789, Washington, now president, requested Jefferson to become the first Secretary of State, which essentially was to oversee foreign affairs. He accepts. Um Jefferson is very concerned with anything that smells of monarchy and was often displeased with the way Washington was treated, like a king in parentheses, and abhorred any talk of a hereditary presidency or Senate. So this is another thing that surprised me. There was a lot of talk of that. Like Hamilton was one of them who like in more and more as his life continued, Hamilton more and more advocated for hereditary presidency, a monarchy or a monarchical more style style, um, which if there's anything Jefferson hated throughout his political career, it was anything that looked like a monarchy. He absolutely abhorred it, yeah. which in the grand scheme of history is why he's remembered as like probably the strongest founding father as far as like republicanism. And when I say Republican republicanism in this context, that doesn't mean Republican versus Democrat republicanism. It was just Liberty essentially back then when they said Republic, I'm a Republican. That just means they were completely anti-federalist, anti-monarchy. They were all about the will of the people. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so he's a cabinet member now with yeah. Hamilton, Secretary and of what, State Henry with Henry Knox. Who's yeah, Henry Knox is Secretary, Secretary of, of War, War. Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury. Um, that's kind of I mean that's the main ones you really yeah. need to know about. John Adams is Vice President. Um, 
So at this point, uh, he finds compromise with Alexander Hamilton over the national debt by agreeing to seat uh, the national government along the Potomac. The other side of the coin was that the federal government would take on all the state's debts. So this was kind of the big, big thing in Hamilton's life. What? No, I just, I mean, keep going. This is what Hamilton was pissed about, right? Or is this what Jeff... Well, Jefferson did not like that. Oh, uh, yeah. Because, because that gave the national government... Debt. Is yes. that what it was? In the, but yes. now the, Virginia's going to have to pay for so essentially, debt. Yes. So, like, Virginia, I think Georgia was one of them, and a few other states had almost completely paid off their debt yeah. to England. Um, and all these other states were, like, way behind. So mm-hmm. the southern states essentially were pissed because they the were slack. having to take up the slack from New York, Massachusetts, and all these states that still owned a ton, like owed a ton of money. Then. Exactly. They were like, why are we, you know, we did our part, but obviously Hamilton was always about a stronger central government. So the compromise that they found, and honestly, it seems like a dumb one on Jefferson's part to me was like, okay, we'll put, we'll put the, the seat of government on on the Potomac in the South. It's like, okay, who freaking cares? Like, um, but back then it was a big deal. The South saw that as a big deal that the seat of government would be down there on their end of things. So whatever that was one of that was like the first political compromise that jefferson was able to find with hamilton because he already freaking hated this did they make this that point. between themselves or did someone a yeah, third party come in to do no, that th- it was them and a uh, somebody else i think it was it might have been james madison it might not have been but somebody else whose name we should know right now i don't yeah. think i don't know if it was clay Dude, I don't know when Henry Clay really, I should, but bro, that man doesn't stop. The fact that he, he was never president is one of the craziest things. Compromise ever. at 18, th- so think about this. He's around um, for the Great Compromise, so it's probably around this time um, when they come up with the split for representation mm-hmm. of, all right, we're going to do Senate and Congress. Yeah. Um, and that's in the late... 1700 I was I would assume yeah, I think Henry Clay was 250 when he Bro, died he, it's crazy the compromise of 1850 yeah. is is also him yeah uh with Missouri Nebraska and Kansas I believe mm-hmm. um but dude he was so I mean he couldn't dude. have been like 20 when he came up with the great compromise for the Senate and uh Congress so yeah that's another <laughs> yeah what is that like another 50 years or mm-hmm. no no another 70 years how old was he, dude? I'm That's... telling you, bro, he was 200 years old when he dude. died. I don't understand. And the he was so influential life. as far as, um, and he was I mean, never he, president, man. He prolonged the Civil War for a long time. Him alone, yeah, he did. He was probably he is arguably the most important American that political no figure that about. well, that's well, never been president. Is what well, I was going to say. That people who don't care about history, yeah, because and it's because he probably because he was never president, president yeah that's right he, he ran even, a bunch of times though a bunch of times bro I he mean, ran he against everybody <laughs> from george washington to bill clinton yeah. and he never became Not president <laughs> he, um, he demanded a recount a couple times yeah <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. um so uh he found himself at odds with hamilton and sometimes adams over what he saw as monarchical design uh desires and designs uh, he detested what he saw as Hamilton's machinations to undermine liberty and the Republic by attaining more legislative power for the Treasury Department the and National warned Bank, Washington yeah. of his opinion. Yeah, That was so, Hamilton's big thing. Yeah, so Hamilton's big thing was the National Bank. He wanted there to be a lot of power in the Treasury Department. And when you look at things from Hamilton's perspective, like Hamilton was a genius in his time. Hamilton was smart as shit. Genius. Yeah, he just knew what he was talking about with that stuff, but it came down to a matter of principle of Jefferson who was not president at this point, so it's fair to say he didn't have all the perspective that someone like Washington, who was very close to Hamilton, did have. But he did not like the idea of anything that gave the national government more power over the states. Like, yeah, he foresaw Jefferson's dream vision of America was states ran by farmers and commerce was a byproduct, whereas Hamilton saw commerce as the driving factor of a nation mm-hmm. um, and just a national bank in it's general. It's tough, debt. To, it's tough to be someone like Hamilton, which I'm assuming I think he was from a more northeastern state, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly, right? Hamilton originally was not from America. Well, yeah, he was from the Caribbean, right? Yeah, but um, because he was like an orphan or whatever from mm-hmm. the Caribbean. Anyway, he had a crazy, crazy yeah, backstory. Crazy story. But anyway, <laughs> um, like imagine though, like trusting states and state government, because I mean that you're having to put a lot of trust mm-hmm. in other people, whereas especially in um like 
with the Second Continental Congress and like more like during the the coming of age during the Revolutionary War. Um, there were a lot. It was a smaller group of guys. It was like, all right, we can trust these guys. So right. it's almost like let's just keep the power between us because we yeah. know we can figure it out. Yeah. But that's not a good long term goal because people right. die. But it's yeah. tough to be like, all mm-hmm. right, we all know what's going on, but now we got to trust. You know, Jim, Jim Bob, Bob up in freaking <laughs> Massachusetts or down in Georgia. Yeah, in Alabama or South Carolina, yeah. like you know. So yeah. I could see the point of like, all right, are people trained enough? Yeah. To know what's to make good decisions, because that's always the argument with Russia and the Russian Revolution is the majority of the population were peasants and they weren't right. educated. So if they were given yeah. the the right, like the the power to vote, they could be easily swayed by some guy that comes in, yeah. and they don't know what you know, because they, I mean, education was just such a, it wasn't at the standard even I know in the 1700s it probably wasn't obviously as high as it should be yeah but i mean in russia it didn't exist so it was you right. know this 10 percent of the population that knew how to spell the word government much <laughs> less like anything else you know and yeah. they're the ones calling all the shots which don't benefit the rest you know so it's yeah. it's hard to trust these people over here that you can't even have a conversation with because yeah. they speak some rural dialect of Russian yeah. and only know how to use you know they're for generations for hundreds of years they've done the same thing there's been no progression of like right. okay I'm a farmer so that one day my son can do something else like they're right. generationally in the same spot right um and so obviously these guys didn't come from Russia but you know right it's a similar thing and that's yeah. a really really good parallel and it's kind of like that video <laughs> that I've seen many times on the internet of that like Middle Eastern leader who's being asked about like people having more rights and he was like he literally says into a microphone, well, the people are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Um, but, yeah, that's a really good point, a really good parallel to kind of, like, you know, bring it back to just it general terms. It would have been terms. tough. It would have been a tough, like, I just can't imagine being in that room being like, yeah, we're going to give a lot of power to the to the people. Yeah. And just hope that they do right. the right thing. Right. Yeah. No, you're totally right. But, again, Jefferson's big thing was, I mean, he was all about the people. It yeah. was all about the will of the people, which, again, that is foundational to the Declaration what of America Independence. Is, yeah. But Hamilton had a lot of good points too. Yeah, like he was like, "Bro, these people can't read." So what are we talking about? Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so in the first year of Washington's second term, Jefferson retired. Washington had pleaded with him to stay. Uh, and yeah. his longtime friend James Madison implored him to remain as well, but he felt that he couldn't under the strains of government, mostly due to the great tensions between he and Hamilton's sides. He seems to have thought it was the end for him in politics, but few others saw it that way. So, yeah, this is another kind of a mark for a lot of historians on Jefferson's career. They're just like, you know, he kind of, you know, wussied out and just couldn't take it anymore. But reading this book, I mean, you can feel the tension and you're like, Dude, something bad is going to happen if these dudes can't figure out a way to, you know, rectify their issues with each other. And the biggest thing to look at in this time is Washington himself. Washington was not a politician. Washington yeah. was really smart. You read Delegator. letters that he wrote and you can see that he was very intellectual. But in a room with Adams, Jefferson, and Hamilton, Washington was the least intelligent one. Oh, yeah. So... Washington was having a lot of trouble. Washington did not want a second term, but he saw the truth that a lot of people around him were telling him that, like, dude, if you duck no one out else now, is ready, yeah. yeah, this is not going to work. You are the glue that's holding all this together. So he begged Jefferson to stay. Jefferson just couldn't do it. Um, he really thought that he was just kind of there for no purpose. Like, he felt like he was kind of being ran over by Hamilton and even Adams some um, as far as their monarchical designs which didn't come to fruition fully because Jefferson ends up becoming president but who knows what what would have happened if Adams got another term because Adams with the alien and alien and sedition acts that he had like did do some pretty crazy stuff that seemed kind of monarchical yeah. um, we'll get to that more but um so yeah first year of Washington's second term he goes back to Monticello the two years between him leaving Washington's administration to becoming vice president he mostly enjoyed his time at Monticello hunting, riding horses, and spending time with his family, but stayed up to date on American po- politics. He was particularly disappointed in the signing of the Jay Treaty, uh, which he saw as just conceding too much to London. Um, we won't stay on the Jay Treaty too much. didn't matter all that much. Jefferson loses to Adams to become the second president by only a few votes. It was three. 
As was custom at the time, there was no campaigning or even a mention of desire from the candidates. Their supporters did all the work to gain votes. Adams served one term in 1797 to 1801. The quasi-war with France took place during Adams' administration due to America's pro-British Jay Treaty that offered the, the French and the American... I don't I, that, that typoed here. The Quasi War of France took place during Adams' administration due to the Amer to America's pro British Jay Treaty that offended the French and the Americans' refusal to be extorted by the French, mostly a series of naval attacks. So yeah, essentially France is like attack attacking a few American ships. There's a couple of naval battles. It never became a full out war because they ended up, you know, making peace. Um the and then British we get do the same thing here coming up then. Huh? That's how the War of eighteen twelve starts. The British start doing yeah. The British start doing the same thing yeah, which is, it's a, we're still a little bit away from that. But Jefferson and many others took issue with the Alien and Sedition Acts. The former gave Adams the power to deport pretty much anyone he deemed a threat. The latter essentially made free speech illegal if it was slander against the administration or something of the like. This was obviously a problem to anyone committed to liberty, but it was a time of the quasi war with France, which gave a Adams what he saw as justifiable cause. So. This was a crazy time, man. Why are we at war with France? Because we didn't support them in the revolution, or what? Well, they were they were just pissed that we the Jay Treaty was very pro London. Like it gave a lot of like conceded a lot of things. With France as much and started trading with yeah, okay. essentially that and just anything that France saw is conceding anything to Britain. I mean, well, France there France was enemies. going was Britain like in, off the wall right now. This is during the French France. Revolution, dude. They're beheading their king and all kinds of crap at this yeah. point in time. So. I mean, the French Revolution was insane, bro. They were yeah. violent in that revolution. So it was just a very uh, touchy time for France. So yeah, little quasi-war. It wasn't a full war because no one ever declared war. Like, no real land, no land battles ever happened. The naval battles that did happen were supposedly pretty horrific and violent. Um, but anyway... <clears throat> The, the narrative of the late 1700s was very hyperbolic, with people like Jefferson seeing monarchical designs in almost everything, while his opponents saw his like as godless. Jefferson referred to the era of Adams' presidency as the reign of witches. So, this was mostly due to the Sedition Acts, which, I mean, dude, the government put a lot of people in the press behind bars for just saying any kind of slander against Adams. So it is the biggest mark on Adams' entire mm -hmm. career. I mean, he was jailing Did people for saying bad in, stuff. In Adams? Oh, yeah, he talks about it. Okay. David McAuliffe is like, all right, so now we're going to get to the part that really okay. makes him look bad. I was just curious if they um, talked about it from that perspective, too. Yeah, it's hard to avoid. Now, In the when you see it from John Adams' perspective, you can kind of see why to a degree. Like, you can understand the principle because – the idea was that if these people are saying this stuff, they're trying to create anti-administration rhetoric to help out the French. Yeah. He said they're trying to basically cause like a freaking civil war. So you can see how, how and why Adams felt it was necessary to, to stop any talk of this because he didn't want people to be influenced to, you know, either want to secede or become pro French over pro America but again, all you got to do is look at the Declaration of Independence and you're like, yeah, bro, this is completely un-American. So for Jefferson, it was very obvious um, why that was, you know, a horrible thing to do. Again, it goes back to Jefferson's commitment to freedom. I mean, yeah. it was all just about freedom unless he was talking about his slaves. So, um, <laughs> my people go. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get to 1801. I put the election of 1801 was wild. I'm such an idiot, dude. I'm reading a freaking well-written book, wow. and I put it was wild. Jefferson Aaron, and Aaron Burr initially tied, so the vote went to the House. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. I remember this. Oh, God. Uh, they finally voted uh, Jefferson in after this 36 is, ballots. But you know who the person is that gives him the nod? It was Henry Clay, wasn't it? It was Hamilton. It was Hamilton. That's right. That's right. Because he hated Aaron, Bo Aaron he hated Burr Aaron more. Burr more. And he had a cool quote where he basically says... And he said this about Adams, I think, more so than Burr. But he basically says, look, if our if this country is going to go down the drain, let it be Jefferson that does it so that it's his political stance that ends up putting things in the yeah, tank sure, rather than makes ours. Sense too. He's like, all right, he's going to fail, and then he'll look worse. Yeah, he was, what, like, was he Speaker of the House, Hamilton, then? Is that who it came to? I don't think Hamilton was in the government anymore at this point. 
I thought he. I thought that's why he had to say in Congress. I can't. I could be. I, I thought it was Henry Clay. Dude, so I don't long. know if Hamilton was actually involved. I can't remember. It wasn't. Check I us in the comments. Yeah, I don't know. I want to say that he was, but again, I could be wrong because it was like one of those things where it was like it may have oh, been like Ham- like Hamilton actually did help Jefferson in a way. Right. Like he gave him the nod, but it was again only because. Right. I mean, he hated Aaron Burr. He dude. hated Aaron Burr. Ends up dying, but. Uh, so they vote him in after 36 ballots. The majority of the population vote one in the end, which was a great victory to all lovers I mean, of liberty and God republicanism. He became president instead of Aaron, Aaron Burr. Burr. Dude, Aaron Burr was Dude. nuts, man. I think this is the time, too, when they, they stopped doing the whole whoever got second becomes vice president, right? Yeah, this is when they stopped doing that. That exact Af- election? It was, no, it was after this election. So oh, Aaron, Aaron Burr, Burr was, was his... vice president ah, in Jefferson's first term, yeah. I guess I did know that, but I forgot. Okay, so, but it was, so, after, so it was Jefferson's second term. That he's like, nah, we're not doing yeah, that. Yeah, that's when they start voting like okay, there's a vice presidential sense. ticket. So I knew it was around that time. Now we get to, I put Jefferson's first inaugural address was a masterpiece, and I put the pages, so I am going to read this. This is okay. so freaking good. Read away. I mean, dude, it's freaking, it's good. Can you grab that uh that device that's plugged in, that pink device right there, and just unplug it for me so it doesn't overcharge? All right, I'm going to plug my phone in as you're reading it. I'm cool. All right, so... <clears throat> So, Thomas Jefferson delivered his inaugural address. In his weak voice, few in the crowded room could hear him distinctly. He read one of the most significant state papers in American history, a brief for freedom and forbearance. All will bear in mind this sacred principle that though the will of the majority in all cases to prevail, is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable, that the minority possess their equal rights which equal law must protect, and to violate would be oppression. Let us then, fellow citizens, unite with one heart and one mind. Let us restore to social intercourse that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things. Every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. Very good quote. We have, we have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. If there be any among us who would wish to, to dissolve this union or to change its Republican form, let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. I know indeed that some honest men fear that a Republican government cannot be strong, that this government is not strong enough. But would the honest patriot... That was a call out. Oh, yeah. But would the honest patriot in the full tide of successful experiment abandon a government which has so far kept us free and firm on the theoretic and visionary fear that this government, the world's best hope, may by possibility want energy to preserve itself? I trust not. I believe this, on the contrary, the strongest government on earth. I believe it the only one where every man at the call of the law would fly to the standard of the law and would meet invasions of the public order as his own personal concern. Sometimes it is said that man cannot be trusted with the government of himself. Can he then be trusted with the government of others? Or have we found angels in the form of kings to govern him? Let history answer this question. I repair then, fellow citizens, to the post you have assigned me, with experience enough in subordinate offices to have seen the difficulties of this the greatest of all. I have learnt to expect that if it will rarely fall to the lot of imperfect man to retire from this station with the reputation and the favor which bring him into it, I shall often go wrong I shall often go wrong through defect of judgment. When right, I shall often be thought wrong by those whose positions will not command a view of the whole ground. I ask your indulgence for my own errors, which will never be intentional, and your support against the errors of others who may condemn what they would not if seen in all its parts. And that's it. Mm. I think there was a little bit. So what was that from again? That's his first inaugural address. I mean, the Mm. best quote to me is, let us then fellow citizens unite with one heart and one mind. Let us restore to social intercourse the harmony, that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things. Every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. Yeah. I mean, that's strong, man. He was basically calling for unity between his own opposition uh, and everybody else. So we'll move on from that. We're taking a lot of time here. 
Jefferson saw his election as a demand for change in the American government, and so he made changes. But he also did the opposite of what the opposing Federalists thought he would do. He did actually increase the size and power of the government, but he did also lower the national debt by about $25 million. And it was only at $87 million when he came in. Can you believe that, bro? We're like $35 million, kabillion, trillion now. Um, though he did spruce things up at the presidential mansion, he carried and dressed himself almost as a simple farmer quite unlike George Washington, who was always formally cut. That's not a knock on George Washington. It kind of just shows Thomas Jefferson's kind of the way he carried himself. He met and dined with lawmakers on a regular basis as he saw open communication and understanding as the surest way to get things done. For 20 years, Jefferson was worried about the British Empire trying to take hold of the West, and in 1802, amidst newfound rumors of the British or the French or the Indians making a play for Western lands, he appointed his private secretary, Meriwether Lewis, to lead an expedition that would find a Western path to the Pacific. Lewis asked William Clark to join him. Um, it didn't, it didn't, that was in 1802. They didn't actually get sent to go until three years later after the Louisiana Purchase, but he appointed him at that point to do it. In September 1802, James Callender, who held a grudge against Jefferson for not receiving a certain political appointment, released an article in a newspaper outing the president's relationship with Sally Hemings in a racist fashion that was of the times, by the way. Jefferson never responded to it and reported it laughed it off when his daughter and former secretary showed him the article. And this is a good John Adams quote. John Adams said it was a natural and almost unavoidable consequence of that foul contagion in the human character, slavery. So... Jefferson gets outed, like there have been rumors of it before, but he gets outed for, you know, having sex and having children with one of his slaves. It clearly did nothing to his career. In February 1802, America learned of Spain selling Louisiana to France, which actually happened in 1800, but it took two years for them to find out. Uh, because of the economic consequence of New Orleans, as well as the general animosities that would arise from having France as a continental neighbor, Jefferson needed to act quickly and efficiently to avert a crisis. He and James Madison decided on James Monroe to be the presidential envoy to Napoleon and France to broker a deal. Due to the potential war with England and the general expenses of an overseas oh, land yeah. ownership, Napoleon decided to sell all of Louisiana and the deal was brokered between France. Million. Uh huh, 15 million. Oh, 15. And Monroe Livingston to purchase the approximately 500 million acres for 15 million dollars I, I know have you seen a map obviously you can like visualize what the louisiana purchase is dude it tripled the size of the country it's huge bro. It's, it's, it ain't louisiana as you but know it today it's the bread basket of america mm -hmm. Giant like, or i think and i could be wrong about this but i heard my dad say some stat about how <clears throat> like we produce like more food and grain than like any other country may uh, that may be wrong again but it was other something about ukraine. like <laughs> and we stand with ukraine <laughs> do we the vec doesn't <laughs> he's like we're not we're not sending money over dude the vec doesn't know what he thinks bro he's all over the place um okay so jefferson sent lewis on his way two days after hearing the news about the louisiana purchase uh, in 1804, his daughter Polly, daughter Polly died. Her health had began failing after giving birth, so now he's only got one daughter, young Patsy. One left. Um, one to go, should I say. <laughs> <laughs> in July 1804, Vice President Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton to death in a, duel that was, <laughs> in a duel that was fought over alleged disparaging remarks Hamilton made about Burr. Burr was indicted for murder in New York and New Jersey, but escaped both. A month later, he was advocating for the separation of states over political issues between the Federalists and Republicans. So this is when Jefferson really starts to realize, wow, Aaron Burr sucks. Um, George Clinton replaced Burr as the candidate for vice president in the 1804 election. Jefferson won re-election against Federalist Charles Pickney with 162 elect electoral votes to 14. So federalism was dying, and it was dying fast. Yeah. Um, clearly, that just shows that Jefferson was loved and that the majority of the people did want republicanism over federalism. Kind of obvious. At this period, Jefferson was seen more as a moderate, a combination of republican and federalist virtues, which Jefferson seemingly intended. He was a principled man, but would sometimes stretch executive power or maneuver to achieve greater overall, overall executive power in situations he deemed necessary such as the Burr trial and his handling of the Tripoli pirates earlier in his presidency. So essentially what he did there, I, I didn't make notes about it earlier, but the Tripoli things kind of already happened. He essentially told, like, sent ships out to 
like go out there and he basically said if any of these pirates bother you sink them and he technically as the executive office was not allowed to do that without congress yeah. approving it so he retroactively did it he told them to go do that and then he told congress to approve it and they did yeah so clearly federalism worked for jefferson every now and then um in june 1807 the hms leopard a british ship attacked the uss chesapeake off cape henry on the coast mm. of virginia and killed three Americans. Jefferson immediately prepared for war. He issued a proclamation banning armed British ships from U.S. waters, set quotas for 100,000 militiamen to be prepared, ordered arms, ammunition, and supplies, and gave these orders unilaterally without congressional approval. So again, when Jefferson saw fit, he bent that Constitution right over his knee and did what he wanted to do. Um, in December 1807... Uh, which is about six months later, after emotions had somewhat faded over the attack, an embargo was passed. Some wished for war, but most, like Jefferson, knew that America wasn't in a position to go to war at the moment. This embargo forbade all foreign trade. This is seen as possibly Jefferson's worst policy decision because of the economical effect, but it doesn't seem he had much else of choice facing wars that America probably couldn't win at the time. So before he did this embargo, it was like, okay, we can go to war with Britain, we can go to war with France, maybe both. Or we can just embargo everybody. Or we can do nothing. He couldn't do nothing because it would look weak and that would have said nothing. So, And they needed America as far as the goods. Yeah, so this hurt Britain really bad. It hurt America really bad too. Dude, Jefferson got letters during this time of people being like, this one dude sent him a letter and called him like a GD son of a bitch and said, I've already had one son starved to death because of your because of you and your decisions. How many more of my kids are you going to let die before you lift this embargo? Oh, my God. He's like, yeah, well, I've lost five, so I don't want to hear it. Um, One, two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> eight, five. So this is kind of um, the end of his presidency. So the embargo is seen as like kind of the biggest thing that a lot of people knock. But when you read about it, he really didn't have a choice. If we had gone to war with either Britain or France, we had essentially no navy. We could not compete with yeah. the British Empire's navy. And economically, we just didn't have the resources at the time. We could not. People don't understand the Revolutionary War. Bro, God himself made us win that war or the simulation programmers, whatever you want to believe in, because we should not have won the Revolutionary War with the odds stacked against us like that. I think it was George Washington alone that made sure we won that war. And we still weren't ready for war at this point during his presidency almost. Or, yeah, about 30 years later. Um, yeah. So Jefferson made the decision that he thought was right. Um, economically, it did mess up a lot of people in America, but he was between a rock and a hard place, okay? He was. So that's pretty much the end of his presidency. Um, in 1808, Jefferson's closest ally and heir apparent, James Madison, won the electoral vo- elector- <laughs> electoral <laughs> Dude, I'm shutting down. Electoral vote against Pickney who was, again, the Federalist choice, uh, who also ran against Jefferson the last time. This he time, really just like, like, let's do it again. <laughs> Come on, it was close Pick last me. time, so let's run it, <laughs> yeah. run it back. This time, Madison won 122 to 47. So absolutely A little bit better. whooped him. Yeah, I mean, they got another 30 votes or so. The transfer of power in 1809 was unsurprisingly smooth, as Jefferson was very happy to see both his closest ally take over the presidency and to return to Monticello and be free from the stresses of the office. A mark on Jefferson to this day, but a characteristic of the times and especially that of a Virginia planner was that he had his children by Sally Hemings, many of whom looked very much like him as slaves at Monticello. So back to this thing, I think this is my last mention of Sally Hemings. They did it all up getting freed when they were 21. He did honor that agreement, but really not much defending it, bro. He had his own children as slaves in Monticello, pretty rough. It just is what it is. Pretty freaking rough. Like, it's a big mark on the guy. Um, and that just is what it is, <laughs> I think. I don't think there's much to say about that. It's pretty bad. <laughs> he had, Come on, man. You, you ever heard of child slavery? You ever heard of a parent having their child <laughs> slavery? <laughs> like, <laughs> now you have. Pretty bad. Um, oh, gosh. At the beginning of 1812, and with the encouragement of Benjamin Rush, Jefferson and Adams began communicating again, and with the old warmth and affection of years preceding the 1790s that politically separated them. So, they're back at it. Um, From this time until their death on July 4th, 1826, they exchanged 329 letters. So, 
pretty fascinating thing. Once both of them, both of them are retired, um, you know, Adams and his wife are in Quincy, Massachusetts, and Jefferson's back at Monticello. I don't believe they ever physically saw each other again um, after they went their separate ways, but they talked a lot. They talked a little bit about politics, but mostly they were just boys, and they were just like, man, it's sick that we're both not having to deal with this bullshit. <laughs> um, with the War of 1812 of Britain, Jefferson's fears of British encroachment and aggression were realized when President Madison was forced to send a war preparation message to Congress in November 1811. During the War of 1812, the British Army burned roughly 3,000 books belonging to the Congress at Washington. Jefferson sold his collection to form the core of the new Library of Congress, which is approximately 6,400 volumes, which is insane. That's a lot of freaking books. And I'd really like to know how many of those Thomas Jefferson volumes like survive at the Library of Congress today. Oh, I'm sure all of them. I hope so. Yeah, I would. I would assume all of them, especially after the yeah. War of eighteen twelve, because they they burned the White House down, I believe, too, in the War of eighteen twelve. Yeah, they really went crazy. But then after that, I mean, the British have, really thought they were about to come over here and take over. We've dude. never been invaded since then. So. No. Which is crazy, bro. That is crazy. We're on an over two hundred year streak where, other than Pearl Harbor. Yeah, we haven't. That was an air invasion, though, so not a technical like yeah land invasion. And that wasn't continental. The continental U.S. has never been invaded. That's true. But if I maybe I'm sure, right? I'm I'm not missing anything where we've no, we've never been invaded. Other than that, yeah, there's never been battles on freaking Monroe American soil. Nice doctrine about Mm -hmm. hey, ain't no colonization. I don't come over this way now. Do not come over here. Don't get Monroe get get get. take over each other, man. Invade each other, dude. You know, um. This is just another like fun fact of like leading up to the War of eighteen twelve that um, like British naval ships would essentially approach like U.S. ships and um, it's called impressment. Did you ever hear about that? Or where they wanted to get like any defectors off the ships? That we're talking about? No, dude. They would like come on to American ships, capture them, and force them into the British Navy. <laughs> That's rough. <laughs> You're Imagine British now. Being chill- <laughs> yeah, just chilling on the high seas, dude. Thinking you're Long John Silver, bro, and then all of a sudden... <laughs> Thinking you're about to find Treasure Island, and then all of a sudden you're British. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and in the British Navy, it's like, all right. Oh, man. Um, so Jefferson's last great accomplishment was the founding and building of the University of Virginia, which he was heavily involved in all aspects of. He watched construction from a telescope on the terrace at Monticello. The issue issue of slavery again arose in Jefferson's life with the Missouri Compromise of 1819. Though he referred to it as a hideous blot on American history, it was one of the only issues in which he would not engage himself to resolve, but many times alluded to the future abolishment of slavery. Even still, while he had his own mixed children as slaves in his own home, he did not think that whites and blacks could live together in America and thought that slaves should all be shipped across the ocean to other continents once dude, they were Dude, that's freed. a crazy take, dude. Did you ever... I took a... I mean, it was Abraham Lincoln's original take. Well, yeah. Uh, what? Because... Um, Which what Abraham called? Lincoln changed a lot during his presidency. Well, he was a free soiler first, and maybe he was... There's a name for it, though, like for the abolitionists that want to return slaves back to Africa. But then I the slaves' know. point were... We weren't born in Africa. Like, bro, we've, we've been, been here, here for, for a, a long time. <laughs> like, yeah. that's not our home. Um, <clears throat> but, dude, isn't that a crazy take? I, I'd never it's crazy, bro. Is it, I want to say continent. I can't remember what what it's called. But anyway, I took a like for my senior sim class to like graduate. Um, it was like me and four other people and, and the professor, and we just had to read these books and talk about it. And the, the theme was abolitionism and uh, or abolitionists in the United States. Mm. And I just had never heard that concept of like. Yeah, let's free them and, and send them back. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know. In one way, it's like, okay, sure, but it's like, well, to where? Yeah. Like, what do you just mean? Just to Africa? Like, like you're just going to throw them on the shore and hope that the people in Africa are like, yeah, we have room. The like, people who sold them to yeah, slave traders? Yeah, they're just going to be like, all right, let's put them on our boat and take <laughs> them somewhere else, take them to the Arabs and sell them there. It's like, I guess on the surface, it sounds like a great idea because it sounds like Africa is is a solid country that are trying to get their people yeah. back but well, it's, it's a combination like, of things it's them kind of just telling themselves in their head like oh that'll be great for them they'll love it over there but it's yeah. them just trying to get rid of the problem and not actually solve it mm-hmm. and resolve it but when Jefferson, did you say the Missouri Compromise was though early 1800 18 like 13 14 or something 1819 1819 dude it's crazy yeah. to think that Henry Clay prolongs the Civil War because I mean it was tensions were so high then mm-hmm. and then until it takes 
compromise 1850, which, you know, over I mean, he had to have lived almost 100 years. And then after that, bleeding Kansas. And it's like, yeah. then still after that, it's not until what, 60, I should 61 know. when. Dude, the Civil that's War a broke long out. time, bro, that they kept making all these compromises to, yeah. to just keep the peace, essentially. Yeah. And that's the, the big thing about the Missouri Compromise is you had free states and slave states that essentially didn't want the other one to get more power in the Electoral College because they mm-hmm. knew that it's either going to lead, like the free states thought, okay, this is either going to lead to an entire co- country of slaveholding states, and the slaveholding states thought, okay, this is just going to be a free well, country. Yeah. And either way, we're going to, like the other one thought they were going to lose their voting power, yeah. essentially. Yeah, um, the free states were like, it's an unfair advantage. Like, they, they don't have to pay their workers. Yeah. But it, it did at least limit, well, I mean, it ended up getting overruled. Any, like, over, like yeah. they just ended up not, like, respecting it. But yeah. it did limit the expansion of slavery. Yeah. And that's when it gets dicey is when California decides to come in as a, as a free state. And California yeah. was technically below the Missouri Compromise line. So all the slave states were like, come on, man. Come on, man. What's going on, man? Oh. Be a slaveholder? Yeah. And then that's um, when things really got dicey. But it's just crazy to think that it lasted that long with tensions so high, bro. It's crazy. I mean, man. almost 100 years. Mm-hmm. See, well, no, nah, it's like probably 70 years, but it's like, that's a long, that's a, a generation. I mean, if, but if you include, A generation of people just living on the edge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is crazy, but Jefferson did. Jefferson was fully confident that abolition would eventually occur. But he just saw it as something that wouldn't happen in his life and left it to later generations. Um, and throughout his political career b- before his old age, which is where we are at this point, he just never felt it was worth it in his political career because almost yeah. nobody really... They had other problems that they need to focus on first, which sounds terrible to say, but... Yeah, but they... they just keeping you know, a As far as they were concerned, alive. they had other problems to deal with. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's that... Uh, uh, Jeffersonian politics mixed with John Quincy's own uh, were great influences on the Monroe Doctrine, which opposed European colonization in the Western Hemisphere. And now we're at the end, and this is one of the most fascinating things about Thomas Jefferson, and it's about his death. On the 50th anniversary of That's July crazy. the 4th, 1776, on July 4th, 1826, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson dies at Monticello. John Adams died the That's same crazy. day. And some of his final words were Thomas Jefferson survives. And the, a really cool thing that John Meacham put like at the end of this chapter was he writes something similar to what I have. Thomas Jefferson survives. And then he puts like a new paragraph. And so he does. And it was the way he ended the chapter. That was pretty cool. Because he is, is cool. Thomas That's Jefferson cool. has a pretty timeless figure in history. So that is uh, essentially the... Kind of my notes. I know that was a lot. I don't know if that was a super great way to do one of these videos. I think it was. Like, we can title it too, just, I mean. Like a summary and takeaway kind of. Well, not even. Just, yeah, but I mean, just in general, of Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. I feel like that was a pretty. I mean, obviously, you can't. I mean, you can go in depth or you could take yeah. a class on Thomas Jefferson. But, yeah, for um, sure. As far I'll, as like a, an overview of like really important topics. Yeah. So did, uh, what did what did you think about me just vomiting all that? Like, did you have any take oh. major takeaways or anything that stuck out to you? Oh yeah, I mean, I learned for sure. I mean, luckily I had already. It helps because I have like a solid. Yeah. At least I don't want to say foundational because there's so many things I don't know, but. I mean, I know you've the, definitely got I know, a solid grasp. I've on, taught this two twice, so yeah. like I've had to read this and then teach it to four classes every day for you know a semester. So I mean, at least you know. So I've. I probably taught a lesson about the rise and and in the conflicts of it because you always teach Jefferson and Hamilton at the same time essentially, right. um, and then I mean you bring in Jefferson too obviously um, with the Declaration of Independence and then obviously once um, George Washington comes in he's a cabinet member so he's brought up then but anyway the big talk about him is is during that when they're both cabinet members and then the, yeah. the debates that they have. Um, so anyway, but it's it, it's fascinating to kind of learn more about the, especially once he goes to Paris and mm-hmm. just the weeds of it. Because I, I like the weeds. That's what you lose as being a teacher. Yeah, everything's like so high view. Um, you don't really get to to dive in. And because I was such a new teacher, I wasn't as good at that. Like the good teachers, they'll like give you the high view, but then at the same time, they're going to give you like all these cool factual details to make them like more of a real person. Right. And so. No, I, I liked it. I think we should do it again, especially uh, these next couple ones I, I still have, like, a decent amount of knowledge about. Um, but then once we start getting further on, 
because I've taught to the Civil War a bunch of times. Twice, right. But at, you, we end at Reconstruction. Oh, okay. So they, they usually split up U.S. history. So you don't get you don't get deep into my boy Grant then. No. That's a shame. Oh, I don't get to him at all. That's a shame. Yeah, it, it I need to talk to your ended. dad about Grant, by the way. What do you I think mean? I think your dad's basing his thoughts on Grant off some some bad sources. Some bad sources, because the last twenty years, historians have now revered him as one of the best presidents in American history. Really? I mean, Chernow, White, all those guys. Hmm. Um, but no, I, I liked it. Good. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything worth saying on all the pictures I took of just different things. Um, I will just say this one. Uh, actually, I'm not. I'm going to just say, so I asked Chat GPT to summarize Thomas Jefferson's life in 400 words or less. They said, it said, Thomas Jefferson, 1743 to 1826, was a prominent American founding father, best known for his role in drafting the Declaration and serving as a third president. Born in Virginia, he was a brilliant scholar and lawyer, graduating from the College of William and Mary. Jefferson's political career began when he was elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses in the early 1760s. He later became a delegate to the Second Continental Congress, where he penned the, the eloquent declaration in 1776, asserting the colony's right to self-governance and freedom from British rule. His influence on American political thought is evident in his advocacy for individual rights, limited government, and the separation of church and state. He believed in agrarian democracy, envisioning a nation of independent farmers and a decentralized government. Jefferson's contributions extended beyond politics. As an architect, he designed his iconic home, Monticello, and played a crucial role in establishing the University of Virginia, advocating for a public education, sh education system that emphasized critical thinking and rationality. In 1800, Jefferson was elected as the third president of the United States, serving two terms from 1801 to 1809. His presidency was marked by the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which significantly expanded the nation's territory. However, however, his presidency also faced challenges, including the Embargo Act of 1807, which aimed to protect American interests during the European conflicts, but resulted in economic hardship. Throughout his life, Jefferson struggled with the contradiction of advocating for liberty while owning slaves himself. He voiced opposition to slavery, but was unable to fully abolish it due to economic and societal complexities. He did, however, include a passage condemning the transatlantic slave trade in an early draft of the Declaration of Independence. After retiring from the presidency, Jefferson continued to be engaged in political discourse through his correspondence and writings. He passed away on July 4, 1826, on the same day as fellow founding father John Adams, coincidentally the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, which actually isn't true. The Declaration was written and signed on uh, July 2nd by most of the founding fathers. Common misconception. Thomas Jefferson's legacy is complex, embodying both his visionary ideas about democracy and his personal contradictions. He left an indelible mark on American history as a key architect of the nation's principles and institutions, whose contributions continue to shape the United States' understanding of freedom, governance, and individual rights. Pretty good 400-word summary from the old GPT bot. Oh, GPT. So, uh... A lot of takeaways to get from Thomas Jefferson. Obviously, he was a great politician. He was uh, very subtle, um, got what he wanted most often, wasn't perfect. Major plank in his eye would be the slave owning and the Sally Hemings stuff. But uh, there's a lot to be learned from these founding fathers. Um, and I hope you did from this video today. Is uh, there anything else to say on this? No, I mean, I know more now about Thomas Jefferson than I did two hours ago. Yeah. And I'm hoping with the nonfiction videos that like, you know, this one was a lot different than the video I did that we did on John Adams. Um, so how this one, you know, how you perceive it or how you like this kind of format, you know, let us know. Um, I prefer I'll, it. I think, dude, yeah, I, I wish think I was like taking more notes on the rise and fall of the third Reich, bro. I could talk about it forever. Oh, dude, I feel like you could, so, we could do a four-hour video on that one with how long oh, it is. Oh, yeah, you'd have to break that up. Just into yeah. the, I mean, this one's. I think this one's about to be two hours long. So. Oh, it's over two hours for sure. For real? Yeah, when, I, when I looked, like, I mean, it's 10 o'clock, so. Oh, my God. Yeah, so I think that's going to do it. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power by John Meacham. I highly recommend it. It's a great read. If you don't read it, hopefully you learned something at least from my summarization of the book today. And uh, we're out. And we are out. And I'm Alexander Hamilton, and this is Aaron Burr. <laughs> no, I want to be Aaron. Get glock.